good evening everyone i welcome you all for the second uh, session of the neurometabolic neurogenetic uh, sg for this uh, second year uh, today we have an interesting talk by dr ingrid tain from uh, canada followed by uh, three uh, brief case discussions and uh, three spotters i request our president dr shivani will be to introduce the speaker for today the moderator the experts and the uh, uh, topic for today over to you thank you uh, good morning good afternoon good evening me all for this uh, webinar today uh, our uh, uh, speaker needs no introduction a globally renowned uh, professional who was past president ikna can i have the slide please asmita yeah so uh, she is founder director of neurometabolic clinic toronto hospital for sick children and uh, she is a professional par excellence with innumerable awards and uh, was the past president of uh, ikna we are really very grateful to have you uh, dr ingrid um, and uh, we are having uh, experts like uh, you know we uh, as we planned earlier as well like we are going to have uh, from different uh, uh, countries uh, uh, different resources so that we have a good uh, discussion so uh, today is the experts we have we are very happy to have dr nihal dundar professor of pediatric neurology from izmir in turkey and uh, she is also in uh, lots of publications and has been uh, leading in the P turkish pediatric neurology society and uh, we have another friend uh, who is joining us from pakistan dr kurat who is consultant pediatric neurologist at qaidi international hospital islamabad pakistan and she is a pediatric neurologist with a special interest in pediatric neurometabolic disorders for which she took some uh, special training from gosh and uh, we are very happy to have you and uh, an expert from india dr lokesh lingappa a very well renowned uh, pediatric neurologist working in uh, uh, rainbow hospital uh, hyderabad thank you all for joining and for uh, moderating the session we have my dear friend and student uh, dear dear one dr sangeeta yoganathan who is a, another professional par excellence and i'm privileged to be her teacher at one point of time and currently she is doing fellowship on neurometabolic disorders uh, with dr ingrid dr sangeeta over to you uh, good morning uh, good evening everyone uh, so today we have an uh, uh, interesting and excellent uh, talk by uh, dr ingrid uh, so without wasting much time uh, uh, ha i hand over to dr ingrid to start the session thank you sangeeta and uh, thank you shafali uh, for inviting me can you see my screen oh yes we can, can see you and hear you and you can hear me okay great um so we'll get started thank you for this kind invitation to speak to you today about neurometabolic disorders that should not be missed um i will be focusing on the vitamin and cofactor response of early onset encephalopathies and seizures these are my disclosures none of which um impact this talk the goals of my talk are to provide you with a a recognition of the clinical phenotypes of treatable vitamin and cofactor response of early onset encephalopathies with seizures b um with uh, the tools for the selection of the appropriate diagnostic investigations and c a strategy for the implementation of effective treatments this slide summarizes a number of the vitamin responsive conditions i will only have time to highlight the features of seven groups of these disorders that i highlighted in green with a reference also to vitamin deficiency states though they may be relatively rare zebras they have given us unique windows into the pathophysiology of metabolic and neurophysiologic pathways and have laid the groundwork for precision medicine precision medicine sees the zebras in all of us and focuses not on what makes you part of the herd but what makes you unique the common features include early onset seizures with encephalopathy developmental delay or intellectual disability with or without regression speech delay a possible movement disorder and usually an additional distinguishing feature which allows further recognition of a specific disorder or pathway most importantly early recognition and treatment is critical to outcome as these children do not respond well to standard anti-epileptic therapies and require the specific vitamin or cofactor for successful management and prevention of morbidity and mortality the first disorder is the glucose transporter or glut1 defect 
GLUT1 may present with three phenotypes, which relate directly to the severity of the mutation. The classic type 1 phenotype presents with early onset seizures with encephalopathy, usually after the closure of the blood brain barrier, acquired and progressive microcephaly, developmental delay, and a mixture of pyramidal, extrapyramidal, and cerebellar signs. This is the severest form, which was first recognized as occurs in most genetic disorders. Subsequently, milder mutations were found, which presented primarily as movement disorders, which now form the majority of known cases. The type 2 form presents with dysarthria, dystonia, and ataxia. The type 3 form is highlighted by chorioathetosis, paroxysmal eye and head movements, or paroxysmal exertional dyskinesia and seizures. The seizures are variegate and may include generalized tonic-clonic, clonic-myoclonic, atypical absence, and atonic seizures. The EEG may show generalized spike or polyspike in wave discharges, mild slowing, or focal discharges. These children also have sleep disturbances and headaches. The cardinal biochemical signature is CSF hypoglycorrhachia, in which the CSF to blood glucose ratio was originally considered to be less than 0.4 in the absence of CNS infection. However, now with milder cases, this has been liberalized to less than 0.5. It is important when doing the lumbar puncture to measure the blood glucose prior to the LP, as the procedure may produce a stress reaction with secondary serum hyperglycemia, thereby leading to a fictitiously low CSF to blood glucose ratio, and thereby a false positive. These children also have a low CSF lactate. Biochemically, there is low red cell glucose transport. This slide highlights the fact that there are a family of glucose transporters in the CNS. You will note that GLUT1 is expressed in granule, pyramidal neurons, in astrocytes, as well as in the blood-brain barrier. This is a boy who has GLUT1 deficiency-associated dystonia. The MRI may be normal or show mild enlargement of the CSF spaces, mild myelination delay, and or high T2 signal of the subcortical U fibers. That scanning shows a global decrease in glucose uptake in the motor cortex, mesial temporal regions, and the thalami. The pathology relates to an impairment in blood-brain uh, barrier glucose transport. It must be remembered that the child's brain has a three to four-fold higher requirement for glucose than the adult brain due to the rapid growth of the brain to 75% of adult size in the first three years of life as well as the higher metabolic rate of the brain up until eight years of age during highly active synaptogenesis and dendritic barbarization. Treatment is through the use of the ketogenic diet, which has been instituted as early as six weeks of age by Dr. Jorge Klepper at a time when there is sufficiently robust ketogenesis through the fatty acid oxidation pathway in infants. This may be accomplished through the medium chain triglyceride or long chain triglyceride oil diet, during which the child needs to be monitored for renal stones, among other side effects. This diet provides good control of seizures and motor symptoms, but has a lesser effect on cognition, as ketones provide an alternate energy fuel for the brain, but do not serve the signaling role of glucose in the brain. A special note, if a child's seizures worsen with phenobarb, diazepam, or chloral hydrate, one should consider GLUT1 deficiency, as these medications in actually inhibit the transporter. GLUT1 is inherited primarily by autosomal dominant transmission and rarely by autosomal recessive uh, roots, and mutations are identified in the SLC2A1 gene. This graph highlights the dramatic response to the ketogenic diet. In a girl who had deceleration of brain growth in the first year of life, to the third percentile, with marked catch-up growth, as you will note here, to the 50th percentile following institution of the ketogenic diet at four and a half years of age. Once again, the earlier the recognition, the better the clinical outcome. Our second disorder is the high affinity plasma level carnitine transporter, Octin-2. To remind you about carnitine metabolism, carnitine balance in tissues depends on the input side on whether the diet is adequate, uh, whereby major dietary carnitine is derived from meat and dairy products, or deficient as seen with a vegan diet, or unsupplemented soy formulas. Whether uh, there is an issue with intestinal malabsorption of carnitine, 
the relative efficacy of the endogenous biosynthetic capacity of the individual, which is reduced in infancy, and the efficiency of membrane transport related to the carnitine transporter, and whether there is exogenous dietary carnitine supplementation. On the excretion side, there are abnormally high demands and utilization of carnitine in various metabolic states, such as inborn errors in metabolism, diabetes, carnitine loss with certain drugs, such as valproic acid, and there may be renal tubular losses in renal acidosis as the renal threshold maintains serum concentrations. I would like to present our first case of infantile onset carnitine responsive cardiomyopathy and myopathy. This child uh, was born in unrelated asymptomatic parents. Her sister presented with cardiomyopathy at one year of age, failure to thrive, recurrent episodes of hypoketotic hypoglycemic encephalopathy, and died tragically by three and a half years of age due to end stage heart failure. Our proband was noted to have a cardiac murmur at, at one month of age and fortunately suffered no acute episodes of hypoketotic hypoglycemia. She developed progressive motor delay with limb girdle weakness and failure to thrive. By three years of age, she had end-stage congestive heart failure with massive left ventricular dilatation and hypertrophy despite aggressive anti-failure therapy and was noted to have peak T waves on ECG. At four years of age, she was found to have very low serum and muscle carnitine with elevated CPK mm -hmm. and a muscle biopsy that showed microvesicular lipid storage with normal beta oxidation enzymes and no dicarboxylic aciduria, as is usually seen with intramitochondrial beta oxidation defects. But she had a marked decreased renal reabsorption of carnitine, which is what we observe in the transporter defect due to the expression of the transporter in the kidneys also. She was thus clinically diagnosed with a carnitine uptake defect and was started on high dose oral L-carnitine at 100 milligrams per kilogram per day divided QID. In the first week, her father noted a marked improvement in his daughter's appetite and affect, which he described as if a light bulb had been turned on. By one month, she had an increase in weight with marked increase in exercise tolerance and inversion of her formerly peak T waves on ECG. By four months, she had good exercise tolerance and a marked decrease in her cardiac dilatation. By five years, she had regained her motor milestones. By six and a half years, her digoxin and diuretics were discontinued. And at nine years, she had an IQ of 140 and was a competitive swimmer. Though her serum carnitine continued to be borderline low due to the renal losses of carnitine. At age 30, she had completed a university degree in economics and played competitive basketball. Had she not been diagnosed, she would have had early mortality as her sister. This slide shows the dramatic response of her left ventricular end systolic and end diastolic volumes from 250% normal down to normal dimensions and ejection fracture by approximately nine months of therapy. We set up an assay to measure carnitine uptake in cultured skin fibroblasts. Uh, these are the normal controls. And showed her to have 2% of control uptake, whereas her obligate heterozygote parents had about 50% of uptake compared to controls. This transporter is ubiquitous, being expressed in all tissues. There is notably a large concentration gradient between the serum carnitine and tissue carnitine, which is five times in brain, 50 times in heart, muscle, and liver, and highest in sperm being 2,000 times. And this um, gradient um, depends on the high affinity plasma level carnitine transporter to transfer carnitine from the serum into tissues. The serum concentrations are tightly maintained by the renal threshold, which should normally reabsorb 95% of the filtered carnitine load. To summarize the literature series, all patients with infantile onset cardiomyopathy, myopathy, and episodic hypoketotic hypoglycemia respond dramatically to high dose L carnitine therapy, on which they are lifetime dependent, but which affords them with a good quality of life to late adulthood in this formerly lethal infantile autosomal recessive disorder. The earlier the diagnosis, the lesser the morbidity from episodic encephalopathy. 
These individuals have a dramatic response within a few weeks to months of therapy, and their plasma carnitine concentrations improve, but are usually low normal due to the continued impairment of the renal carnitine transporter. We have now also been recognizing milder mutation phenotypes with autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, as carnitine may function in the brain as a donor of acetyl groups to choline for the formation of acetylcholine for cholinergic neurotransmission, as well as an antioxidant for neuroprotection, among other roles. Our third group of disorders are the creatine deficiency disorders, which can be diagnosed early on MRS. I will first review the pathway of creatine biosynthesis, which allows understanding of the tailored treatments. Arginine and glycine are converted into guanidinoacetic acid and ornithine in the kidney by arginine glycine amidinotransferase or agate. GAA is then transported to the liver where in the presence of S-adenosylmethionine, uh, it is converted into creatine by GAMPT or guanidinoacetate methyltransferase. Now creatine uh, is then ready for transport into tissues such as brain, muscle, and heart. The excellent creatine transporter defect affects boys most severely, but can also affect girls who lionize poorly. It accounts for up to 3.5% of boys with intellectual disability. The seizures may be generalized tonic-clonic, focal, focal discognitive, or myoclonic, and there is usually severe developmental delay or regression with particularly marked speech delay. There may be an associated extrapyramidal movement disorder. Most notably, these boys often have autistic features and ADHD with major behavioral issues. The unique features include this mid-facial hypoplasia. They also have constipation, megacolon, ulcers and perforations, which is related to defective creatine transport in intestinal epithelial cells, where creatine and phosphocreatine provide an intracellular high energy phosphate buffering system, essential for maintaining ATP supply in tissues with high energy demands. They can be diagnosed early based on MRS of the brain, which shows absence of the creatine signal in all three creatine deficiency disorders with severe depletion of creatine to phosphocreatine in brain. These children have increased creatine in plasma and urine. Most notably, they have normal guanidinoacetic acid, which distinguishes them from the other two disorders. Biochemically, there is decreased creatine uptake in fibroblasts. The MRI in these children is mildly abnormal, with mildly delayed myelination, a thin corpus callosum, and cerebral and cerebellar atrophy. The MRS profile, so this is the normal profile, as you can see the creatine peak at three parts per million. The MRS uh, in these children show a markedly reduced creatine peak. Please consider including MRS with MRI in young children with developmental delay and seizures for the valuable information it may provide. Treatment for the creatine transporter defect includes creatine supplementation. However, this may not be effective depending upon the severity of the transporter defect. The additional more effective strategy is to promote endogenous creatine biosynthesis in the brain by providing the child with a precursor of L-arginine and glycine. In one study, L-arginine for nine months did not show an improvement in speech, behavior, motor skills, or brain creatine. However, in a longer study of one year in a nine-year-old, there was a demonstrated improvement in neurologic language and behavioral status and evidence of increased brain creatine as shown in this MRS. From here to there. At present, it is also recommended to give s methionine, which combines with the guanidinoacetic acid to make creatine through GAMT. The second disorder is autosomal recessive agate deficiency, which has a similar clinical profile and severe brain creatine depletion in which there's a block in the transfer of a guanidine, guanido group from arginine to glycine to form guanidinoacetic acid, which is the precursor of creatine. These children are distinguished by having low blood and urine GAA. There is some improvement with oral creatine 
And most importantly, early intervention of two months may prevent phenotypic expression of the disease altogether, which is primary prevention. The third disorder in this series is the autosomal recessive disorder GAMP deficiency. The clinical phenotype is very similar to the other two disorders, but has in addition a, a marked extrapyramidal movement disorder, including ataxia, myoclonus, and dystonia, which is likely due to the toxic accumulation of the guanidinoacetic acid in the globus pallidus, as shown in this T2 MRI. Biochemically, this disorder is distinguished by the accumulation of guanidinoacetic acid in brain, which can be seen on MRS at 3.78 parts per million and in body fluids, which may be responsible for the intractable seizures and movement disorder. The pathology is characterized by marked myelination delay. The treatment with oral creatine is only partly successful. In this MRS, you can appreciate the increase in brain creatine following following creatine therapy. The clinical outcome is improved by restricting dietary arginine and providing ornithine in order to reduce the actual reduction of the guanidinoacetic acid. Treatment at the asymptomatic stage prevents the phenotype. The earlier the introduction of therapy, the better the outcome. Though even in young adults that have been missed, there can be a clinically significant response to therapy of the movement disorder by reduction of the GAA. Our fourth group of disorders are those responding to biotin, which is an important cofactor in the metabolism of fatty acids and leucine and in gluconeogenesis, which helps to predict the biochemical abnormalities on metabolic screening. The sources of biotin in the diet include royal jelly, Swiss chard, tomatoes, almonds, eggs, and onions. Therefore, deficiency states are relatively rare. Causes of biotin deficiency, which are relatively rare and mild, include excessive consumption of raw egg whites, which contain avidin, which binds the biotin, as well as patients with decreased intake, such as those who have had gastrectomies or who have increased metabolic demands, such as burn patients, epileptic patients, athletes, and pregnant or lactating women. The clinical signs of biotin deficiency include decreased appetite and growth, which are very nonspecific and uniquely alopecia, porosis, which is a chondrodystrophy of the sternum, and fatty liver and kidney due to the importance of biotin in fatty acid oxidation. Biotin is an essential cofactor for the transfer of carbon dioxide in several carboxylase enzymes, including acetyl-CoA carboxylase alpha and beta in fatty acid oxidation, methylcrotonyl-CoA carboxylase and propionyl-CoA carboxylase in isoleucine metabolism, and pyruvate carboxylase in gluconeogenesis. This slide demonstrates the biotin cycle, showing the role of the enzymes biotinidase in the recycling of biotin, and holocarboxylase synthetase, which catalyzes the attachment of biotin to the five carboxylases. Holocarboxylase synthetase deficiency is a severe autosomal recessive disorder and depending upon the severity of the mutation may have neonatal onset and in milder mutations later onset even up to six years of age. There are striking distinguishing systemic features including alopecia, keratoconjunctivitis, and perioral erosions as well as vomiting, irritability, and lethargy. The neurologic features again include encephalopathy with seizures, hypotonia and feeding difficulties, and there is a high morbidity and mortality rate which critically depends upon the time to diagnosis and treatment. The biochemical profile reflects the inability of the binding of biotin to biotin-dependent carboxylases, which leads to decreased activity of pyruvate carboxylase, propranol-CoA and alpha-methylcrotonol-CoA carboxylases, and the resultant accumulation of urinary 3-hydroxyisovaleric and 3-hydroxypropionic acid and the lactic acidosis. The plasma biotin concentrations here are normal. 
Oligocroxylase synthetase deficiency can be diagnosed by measurement of its activity in leukocytes or fibroblasts and by gene mutation analysis. Prenatal diagnosis can be made in amniocytes or chorionic villus biopsy. Treatment involves high dose biotin supplementation at 10 to 20 milligrams per day and up to 40 milligrams for normalization of the biochemical abnormalities. And in rare severe cases, up to 100 milligrams per day to actually reverse the clinical symptomatology. These are the dramatic dermatologic features which are presumed to be due to impaired fatty acid metabolism and may also relate to the importance of biotin and zinc homeostasis in the skin and include the red scaly rash with or without erosions over most of the body resembling psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis or ichthyosis. It is especially uh, prominent around the orifices. Alopecia and conjunctivitis may also be present. A second biotin responsive disorder is biotinidase deficiency or late onset multiple carboxylase deficiency, which is an autosomal recessive disorder and occurs in approximately one in 40,000 newborns, but is significantly increased to one in 7,000 in Turkey and one in 9,000 in Brazil, which may relate to higher detection rates. It has marked variability in phenotypic expression depending upon the severity of the mutation, which affects the residual activity of the enzyme. Those with less than 10% activity have a severe phenotype with seizure onset by three months of age, which may be consistent with an Otohara syndrome or infantile spasms. Those with 10 to 30% activity may have a partial phenotype, who when stressed manifest with intermittent cerebellar ataxia and residual activity above this may be entirely asymptomatic. The main features include intellectual disability, hypotonia and ataxia, with sensory neural hearing loss and optic atrophy, as well as the skin rash and alopecia. The recurrent infections, which tend to be fungal and viral, appear to be due to a defect in cellular immunity. The biochemical profile shows uh, the serum ketoacidosis and lactic acidosis and on urine organic acids, one finds 3-hydroxyisovaleric acid, beta-methylcrotonylglycine, and 3-hydroxypropionic acid. Biotinidase enzyme activity is decreased in serum or plasma. The pathology is characterized by diffuse cerebral and cerebellar atrophy, delayed myelination, and may have basal ganglia calcifications, which is a helpful neuroradiologic feature for narrowing the diagnosis. Treatment consists of 5 to 20 milligrams per day of biotin, which results in a rapid clinical and biochemical improvement. However, any prior central nervous system injury, such as intellectual disability, ataxia, sensory neural hearing loss, and optic atrophy may not be reversible, again underlying the extreme importance of early diagnosis. As a practical point, Biotin is usually dispensed as a tablet or capsule, and to administer it to an infant, the tablet can be crushed or the contents of the capsule mixed with breast milk or formula in a spoon or syringe. It should not be put into a bottle because the mixture will stick to the bottle and or fail to pass through the nipple, thus giving inconsistent doses. This disorder can now be recognized on newborn screening or by biotinidase assay, which is part of newborn screening in Ontario. This slide demonstrates the alopecia and seborrheic dermatitis before treatment. On neuroimaging, there may be diffuse cerebral and white matter atrophy with delayed myelination, ventriculomegaly, widened extracerebral spaces, and increased lactate on MRS. This CT scan at six weeks of age in an affected infant shows the white matter hypodensities. And following one year of biotin therapy at 14 months of age, there's no white matter hypodensity and only slightly enlarged frontal horns. Moving on to our next disorder, we have the autosomal recessive biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disease arising from biallelic mutations in the SLC19A3 gene, which encodes the thiamine transporter 2. Of note, the carrier frequency is as high as 1 in 500 newborns in Saudi Arabia. 
from the large series of patients described by Dr. Brahim Tabarki from Saudi, there are three phenotypes depending upon the severity of the mutations. First, there is an early infantile lay-like syndrome, which presents in the first three months of life with atypical infantile spasms, acute encephalopathy, vomiting, poor feeding, and severe lactic acidosis, both in blood and sepsis. The classic form presents between three to 10 years of age with recurrence of acute encephalopathy, characterized by confusion, seizures, brainstem signs with external ophthalmoplegia, supranuclear facial palsy, and dysphagia, extrapyramidal signs characterized by ataxia, dystonia, and coagulopathy, and pyramidal signs, and is triggered by febrile illness, mild trauma, or stress. Biochemically, these children have normal lactate, ammonia, biotin, and thiamine levels, and a normal CSF profile. The third form, the adult form, um, presents as a Wernicke-like uh, encephalopathy with acute onset of status epilepticus, ataxia, nystagmus diplopia, and ophthalmoplegia in the second decade of life. Diagnosis is made by testing for biallelic pathogenic variants in the SLC19A3 gene. The prompt administration of biotin at 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram per day and thiamine at 40 milligrams per kilogram per day early in the disease course results in partial or complete improvement within days in the classic childhood and adult presentations, but most with the severe infantile presentation have had poor outcome even after supplementation with biotin and thiamine. Acute encephalopathic episodes may require care in an ICU to manage seizures and increased intracranial pressure. During acute decompensation, thiamine may be increased to double the regular dose and be given intravenously. The dystonia is effectively treated with trihexyphenidyl or L-DOPA. Brain MRI shows swelling and bilateral and symmetric increased T2 signal intensity in the caudate, putamen, and thalamus, and lesions in the infra and supratentorial brain cortex, cerebellum, and brainstem. Basogenic edema is seen during the acute crises on DWI and ADC. Chronic changes include atrophy and necrosis of the caudate and putamen with diffuse cerebral cortical and, uh, less, and to a lesser extent cerebellar atrophy. Spinal cord involvement has been seen also in one case. Axial flare image shows bilateral basal ganglia uh, with the arrows here in A and cortical involvement as shown by these asterisks. Increased diffusion weighted imaging signal is observed in B in the basal ganglia and thalami, and accounts for the vasogenic edema in the same regions as demonstrated by increased diffusion on the ADC map in C. Cortical involvement observed on DWI represents shine through artifact as demonstrated by lack of signal alteration in the cortex on the ADC map. These coronal T2 images uh, demonstrate bilateral basal ganglia uh, lesions here in D, lesions in the thalami and red nucleus in E, and in the cerebellum uh, involving the vermis and notably edema. I would like to briefly touch on the highly treatable Wernicke's encephalopathy, which can be life-threatening with major poorly reversible morbidity, if not recognized early, in children at risk for thiamine deficiency, which can occur in malabsorption syndromes and with chemotherapy, and which may be relevant in a number of our patients. We have seen three cases at SickKids in the past six months. This is the case of a seven-year-old girl with repaired gastroschisis and short gut syndrome who presented with a four-day history of progressive encephalopathy, truncal ataxia, and omnidirectional gaze of nystagmus. She had a marked increase in serum lactate and her blood thiamine level was markedly reduced. Based on her clinical and radiologic diagnosis, she was treated with hydrocyamine and her lactate normalized in one day, and she had a rapid clinical recovery. Based on a literature review, the thiamine dosing recommendations in young children is approximately 100 milligrams IV daily times seven days. In older children or non-responders, adult dosing may be needed at 500 milligrams IV TID times two to three days, followed by 250 milligrams IV daily for another two to three days. 
The pathophysiology of the increased lactate is presumed secondary to the role of thiamine as a cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha-ketoglutarate alpha dehydrogenase. Brain MRI and MRF show diffusion restriction bilaterally uh, in the striata and in the medial thalami. In B, we see increased T2 signal in the periaqueductal, periaqueductal gray. And in C, we see involvement of the uh, mammillary bodies on chromal T2. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy demonstrates a large lactate doublet at 1.3 uh, three parts per million. Turning now to our final group of disorders, we will now focus on pyridoxine and pyridoxal L-phosphate responsive seizures and encephalopathies, and focusing on two of these disorders out of the seven. Pyridoxine, or vitamin B6, is converted to its biologically active form of pyridoxal 5' prime or pyridoxal L-phosphate by the enzyme PNPO. Pyridoxine has many cellular functions, including balancing sodium and potassium, promoting red cell production, decreasing the formation of homocysteine, preventing eczema, and as a precursor for PLP, which is a critical cofactor for aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, which converts 5-hydroxytryptophan into serotonin and L-dopa into dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. The dietary sources include dragon fruit, grains, and nuts. This is the beautiful but bigger, bitter dragon fruit, which are, originates in Southeast Asia. Pyridoxine may be given with isoniazide in anti-TB therapy at 10 to 50 milligrams per day to prevent peripheral neuropathy and CNS toxicity. As with most vitamins, cellular homeostasis is key in that too little or too much may result in sensory neuropathy. Pyridoxine deficiency may lead to chelitis, as shown here, and conjunctivitis. Sideroblastic anemia is seen in the smear as well as neonatal onset seizures, irritability, and confusion. The pathophysiology of the CNS phenotype likely relates to the impairment of the decarboxylation of glutamate to GABA, important in inhibitory neurotransmission, and in the impaired transamination of glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate, which is critical for mitochondrial anaplerosis and ATP generation. In contrast to the deficiency disorder, we have the genetic autosomal recessive disorder of paradoxin-dependent epilepsy, which is due to alpha amino acid semialdehyde dehydrogenase deficiency, which is the antiquitin gene ALDH7A1. The prevalence of this disorder varies from 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 64,000 and is seen in all ethnic groups. Depending upon the severity of the mutation, one may have prenatal onset with intrauterine seizures or postnatal seizures that begin on the first day of life. However, remarkably, there have been milder cases that have presented as focal seizures as late as three years of age. The seizures may be intractable, clonic, generalized tonic, myoclonic, or rarely infantile spasms. In the classic severe cases, the infants are resistant to all standard anti-epileptic drugs and have complete and immediate cessation of seizures with intravenous pyridoxine. Additional features may include respiratory distress, acidosis, abdominal distension with vomiting and poor sleep. Despite early therapy and good seizure control, most children will have mild to severe developmental delay and speech delay, though a small proportion of that normal development, likely with milder mutations. MRI may be normal or show hypoplasia of the corpus callosum, ventricular megaly, and atrophy. It has been suggested that prenatal therapy with maternal pyridoxin may improve outcome. However, this could only happen for a subsequent sibling in a family following prenatal testing. The defective enzyme is alpha amino adipic semialdehyde dehydrogenase in the picocholic acid pathway of lysine catabolism. The biomarkers are an increase in plasma urine and CSF picocholic acid and AASA. Pathophysiology relates to the production of piperidine 6 carboxylate, which inactivates PLP. From our CIHR Canadian Metabolic Epilepsy Consensus Meeting, which brought together epileptologists and metabolists from across Canada and the United States, we ascertained that the clinical factors that should make one suspect PDE include seizures of unknown etiology in a previously normal infant without an abnormal gestation or perinatal history, occurrence of long-lasting focal or unilateral seizures, signs of encephalopathy, 
preceding the seizures, history of severe epilepsy in a sibling, often with status leading to death, and parental consanguinity. Eight typical presentations in which PDE should be considered also include infants and children with seizures who are partially responsive to anti-epileptic drugs, particularly if associated with developmental delay, neonates with HIE and intractable seizures, patients with a history of transient or unclear response to pyridoxin, patients with a history of folinic acid response, and seizures in any child less than one year of age without apparent cause. The biochemical pathophysiology of antiquitin deficiency is shown in the slide. L-lysine is catabolized by the sacropene pathway in mitochondria to AASA and by the pipicolic acid pathway in peroxisomes to piperidine 6 carboxylate, which is in equilibrium with the AASA. Both accumulate proximal to the block in uh, alpha amino adipic semialdehyde dehydrogenase. The piperidine 6 carboxylate condenses with pyridoxal L or pyridoxal 5 prime phosphate, resulting in PLP deficiency. The pipicolic acid thereby accumulates due to back pressure from the enzymatic block. This slide demonstrates the urinary AASA concentrations in patients. Patients are up here, and these are the normal controls. You will note that there is an age-related decrease in AASA. However, the patients have consistently elevated levels, and these persist despite treatment with pyridoxy. Our second genetic disorder relates to a block in pyridoxamine 5 prime phosphate oxidase, or PNPO, which converts the P pyridoxin into PLP. These children may have premature birth and seizure onset day one or even in utero. There are now three subgroups proposed based on the severity of the mutations. First, a neonatal onset uh, seizures may be clonic, myoclonic, or status of autism. These children are distinguished by their rotatory eye movements, hyperexcitability, and hypersalivation, and their EEGs may show a severe burst suppression pattern or myoclonic epilepsy. These children respond to PLP. Secondly, infantile spasms. Uh, which respond to PLP, and thirdly, infants with seizures starting before three months of age, which respond to pyridoxin. The biochemical markers include hypoglycemia, early acidosis, pancytopenia, and coagulopathy. The CSF and urine biochemical profile is consistent with the reduction in PLP-dependent enzymes, including AADC, which results in a decrease in CSF, HVA, and 5-HIAA. Quantitative amino acids demonstrate raised glycine, threonine, taurine, and histidine, and low arginine. This slide demonstrates the pathway for conversion of pyridoxamine phosphate and pyridoxine phosphate, vitamins of B6, into PLP by the enzyme PNPO. This slide demonstrates the pivotal role of PLP as a cofactor for aromatic amino acid decarboxylase in the conversion of L-DOPA to dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline, and 5-hydroxytryptophan into serotonin. The resultant deficiencies in dopamine may contribute to the dystonia and intellectual disability, and in serotonin to the sleep disturbance, restlessness, and irritability. The overall clinical phenotype relates to the disturbance in neurotransmitter metabolism. Neuroimaging is characterized by progressive hypomyelination and global cerebral atrophy. This is an autosomal recessive disorder with biallelic mutations in the PNPO gene. There is a rapid response to the end product of PLP in the neonatal onset seizures and infantile spasms, and a response to pyridoxine in a milder subgroup with seizures under three months of age. Early diagnosis and treatment in the first few days of life can be associated with normal neurodevelopment in childhood up to 11 years of age with normal neuroimaging as reported from Australia. It is possible that paradox and responsiveness in PNPO deficiency is affected by prematurity and at an age at the time of the therapeutic trial. Other additional factors that are likely to influence treatment response and outcome include riboflavin status, and how well the fetus has been supplied with B6 from the mother. The following three slides now are summary slides. As mentioned at the beginning, the common features for these vitamin cofactor responsive conditions are epilepsy with or without encephalopathy, developmental delay with or without regression, speech delay, and possible movement disorder. 
On this slide, I have listed the additional distinguishing features that help to clinically differentiate between these disorders. If there is prominent um, autism spectrum disorder, think about the creatine deficiency disorders, though it's, this isn't entirely specific. If there is acquired microcephaly, think about GLUT1 deficiency. Basal ganglia calcifications can be seen in biotinidase deficiency. Hypomyelination or myelination delay is seen in GAMPT and PNPO deficiency. Constipation with megacolon occur in the excellent creatine transporter defect and paradoxin-dependent epilepsy. If there's eczema, consider biotinidase deficiency. Classic PDE can be diagnosed by the administration of 100 milligrams of intravenous pyridoxine to an infant with intractable seizures, which show a dramatic clinical and EEG response. It is critical to give IV paradoxin only in an NICU setting where intubation is readily available in the event of an apnea, which is likely related to a sudden increase in GABA. The ongoing treatment is 30 milligrams per kilogram per day divided TID to a maximum of 200 milligrams in infants and up to 400 milligrams in adults. There is current work looking at the additional efficacy of a lysine-restricted diet to decrease the production of piperidine 6 carboxylate. PNPO deficiency is treatable with 30 milligrams per kilogram per day of PLP divided TID. Please remember that PLP treats both PNPO deficiency and pyridoxin dependent epilepsy deficiency. But pyridoxin does not treat PNPO deficiency except for very mild cases. There is a variant of PDE known as linic acid responsive seizures, which is due to the antiquity defect, which has yet to be identified which has a yet to be identified CSF marker on gas chromatography known as PEAK-X and which requires both standard paradoxin dosing as well as folinic acid at five milligrams per kilogram per day divided TID. Biotinidase deficiency is diagnosed by the plasma biotinidase assay and requires five to 10 milligrams of biotin per day. And depending upon the severity of the defect may require doses up to 20 milligrams per day. GLUT1 deficiency is diagnosed by a CSF to plasma glucose ratio of less than 0.4 and SLC2A1 mutation analysis and is treatable with a ketogenic diet. The plasma lamell carnitine transporter defect is suggested by very low serum carnitine concentrations, decreased renal reabsorption of carnitine, and opt-in to mm. mutation analysis. Fibroblast carnitine uptake studies are useful when a mutation is not found, as in approximately 18% of cases, uh, suggesting a uh, five prime UTR mutation or entronic mutation um, may not be found on standard um, sequencing. Treatment with high dose L-carnitine at 100 milligrams per kilogram per day divided QID for life is life-saving and reverses the disease pathology and is previously a lot of similar recessive disorder of childhood. The creatine deficiency disorders can be diagnosed by MRI spectroscopy, which shows a very low creatine peak. The three disorders can be distinguished by measurement of urine GAA, which is normal in the excellent creatine transporter defect, low in agate deficiency, and high in GAP deficiency. The treatment in the creatine transporter is with creatine, arginine, and glycine. In agate, it is with creatine. In GAP deficiency, it is with creatine and a low arginine diet with ornithine supplementation. The thiamine transporter 2 defect can be diagnosed by mutation analysis of the SLC19E3 gene and is highly treatable with high-dose biotin and thiamine if instituted early in the classic and adult forms. This summarizes our approach to frequent or intractable neonatal seizures. Originally, the recommendation was to start with paradox and bolus of 100 milligrams IV, followed by maintenance therapy. If there was no response after 24 hours, to add folinic acid for three days, and if there was no response, to substitute PLP. Our preference now is to provide earlier intervention and to give PLP with folinic acid for more rapid control of seizures, as this would treat PDE, folinic acid responsive PDE, and PNPO deficiency, and then to wait for biochemical and genetic results, at which time the treatment could be further tailored. One could also consider adding biotin. Our biochemical workup would include the following, serum glucose, lactate for mitochondrial disorders, ammonia for urea cycle disorders, quantitative amino acids for amino acidopathies, acyl carnitines for fatty acid oxidation defects, biotinidase, and if available, alpha amino aldehyde and pipicolic acid. 
urine amino acids, organic acids for organic acidurias, uh, sulfocysteine for sulfide oxidase deficiency, or molybdenum and cofactor deficiency. CSF glucose for GLUT1, lactate, amino acids for hyperglycinemia, neurotransmitter analysis. This would then be followed by sequencing of the candidate gene, an epilepsy gene panel, or if unknown, rapid whole exome sequencing uh, or trio whole exome sequencing if available. In conclusion, careful clinical phenotyping and biochemical screening in a high index of clinical suspicion can facilitate early institution of specific vitamin and cofactor trials, which can have a critical impact in reducing neurologic morbidity and mortality. Understanding the biochemical pathophysiology can facilitate the development of specific therapies to bypass the block, reduce accumulation of toxic metabolites, and or promote use of alternative pathways in a physician medicine approach. The careful clinical phenotyping can tailor and direct the genetic investigations, which may take time through gene panels unless one has access to rapid whole exome sequencing. When a tsunami of new variants of uncertain significance are found, correlation with the clinical phenotype is key, along with the sequencing of the candidate gene in the parents to determine if the variants are in cis or de novo, as well as in silico modeling to determine the impact of the mutation on protein structure function, which may aid in determining the pathogenicity of the unknown variant. Most of these disorders are autosomal recessive in inheritance. Therefore, it is important to search for consanguinity and a history of previously affected siblings. Most importantly, please consider these disorders in a child with unexplained encephalopathy and seizures, which are not responsive to standard antiepileptic drugs, as uncontrolled seizures will lead to further neural damage, which may become irreversible and may be the difference between a child who has marked intellectual disability and is fully dependent to one who becomes independent with unlimited future potential. As child neurologists, we must consider these treatable conditions. We have moved from a symptom-based intuitive medicine approach to a current pattern and evidence-based medicine, and we're moving towards an algorithm-based precision medicine approach targeted to the management of the impact of a specific mutation within the genetic background of a given individual. I thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ingrid, for this uh, excellent uh, comprehensive lecture. Uh, we really appreciate your effort and passion you put into the teaching. So as a clinician, it's always very important for us to understand and identify the phenotypes of uh, treatable neurological disorders. And one such group is the vitamin responsive and cofactor responsive uh, uh, epilepsies and encephalopathies. So uh, you, have, uh, you have given a nice overview of the clinical presentations, the biochemical pathways, the laboratory findings, and the treatment aspects of all these treatable uh, uh, res vitamin responsive neurological disorders. So we'd like to hear comments and experience from our experts of the today's session, Dr. Nihal and Dr. Kurat. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening uh, from Turkey. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, presentation. I think uh, this is the, one of the most important issues, uh, treatable uh, epileptic encephalopathies. Uh, I want to ask about uh, pyridoxine uh, duration, usage of pyridoxine duration. Uh, if uh, it does not have enough uh, effect. Uh, I want to uh, ask in another way, uh, is there a maximum duration uh, we have to wait for the pyridoxin uh, effect? For pyridoxin effect? Yes. So you're saying pyridoxin. Okay, just yes. wanted to clear. By that. Um, I think that um, there are cases that the response to pyridoxin may not be as robust as one would like, but I think that it is important to continue in those cases that you have still a high index of suspicion. Um, as I mentioned, those criteria that we had where there was strong criteria for pyridoxin-dependent epilepsy in, in children who have unexplained encephalopathy seizures that don't respond to standard and anti-epileptic drugs. And then there's a group where um, the response is not as clear, uh, but 
even in those cases, I think it's important to continue the paradoxin until one gets the genetic results back. Uh, because you want to optimize the situation and you don't want to risk there being breakthrough seizures, which can then incur further neural injury. Um, so I think uh, one should continue until one is able to confirm uh, by genetic testing, whether it is indeed per, uh, an antiquitin gene defect in the ALDH7A1. Yes, thank you. We have to wait, uh, genetic um, testing. I think in so. those patients with uh, pyridoxin-dependent epilepsy, when there is not an adequate response to pyridoxin, uh, we, can, uh, we can always try uh, stepping up the dose of pyridoxin to the maximum and also uh, try the triple therapy where uh, Dr. Ingrid was mentioning in her slides, like uh, the restriction of lysine in the diet. And also there are uh, reports of supplementation of arginine, which competes with lysine at the level of blood-brain barrier. So it's ultimately the breakdown product of lysine in the cerebral lysine metabolism. Uh, and my question is like, uh, in case those children who are respond not responding to py uh, pyridoxin supplementation, is there a role to supplement pyridoxal 6-phosphate? Because the ultimate mechanism is cellular depletion of pyridoxal 6-phosphate due to chemical uh, condensation as a result of elevated pyridin 6-carboxylate. So yes. can we uh, try in those patients additionally pyridoxal 6-phosphate? I think that um, that's that's become our general recommendation that if um, uh, one is not getting, let's say, the response with pyridoxin, uh, to give uh, pyridoxal L-phosphate with folinic acid, because that would treat the three conditions. Uh, it would treat PNPO deficiency, it would treat folinic acid responsive pyridoxin dependent epilepsy, as well as pyridoxin, you know, classic antiquitin gene defects, and. If one uses that combination, uh, then one can wait for the genetic and the biochemical results to make a confirmation one way or another as to what the very specific defect is. And once one has that, then one can tailor the treatments after that. Um, you're certainly correct that um, lysine restricted diet is something that is being looked into right now for pyridoxin dependent epilepsy just to decrease the amount going through the pipicolic pipico acid uh, pathway in peroxisomal metabolism. So that's a, an interesting modality that people are looking into to see whether that can improve the phenotype. And that said, uh, I covered just two of the seven conditions that may respond to pyridoxin. There's an expanding number that have dependence on pyridoxin or pyridoxal L-phosphate. Uh, but I, I covered the ones that are, let's say, um, better known. Uh, antiquitin is certainly of higher um, um, prevalence than PNPO deficiency, but these are the two main ones that I think we as child neurologists um, may, may be confronting in terms of treatment. And the use of arginine is very interesting. So I think that again is something that we will hopefully learn more in the future. Thank you. Dr. Kuttar, Gorat. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Teen, for such a comprehensive, incredible and wonderful presentation. So I have two questions. Uh, so what is your experience with uh, neonatal seizures with molybdenum cofactor deficiency? And secondly, I have uh, uh, three siblings who have been diagnosed with GAMT deficiency with cerebral creatine deficiency syndrome. So I have started uh, all three of them, especially the younger one who is three years of age, he presented with the typical features, the behavioral movement and seizures. So I have started him ornithine, sodium benzoate and creatine. And I have tried to restrict arginine and glycine. So the active issue that I'm facing is that definitely in a resource limited country, we have affordability issues. And secondly, the child has started to develop crystals. So how do you balance uh, the commonly I'm anticipated sorry. Side effects? Uh, with I'm sorry, I couldn't, I didn't understand the child has developed what? You, you mentioned so the just... Child, so the child, so the recent uh, urine complete examination shows that it is showing coagulate crystals. So my question is, for how long in such cases should we continue giving uh, uh, the treatment considering the benefits? I know it's a lifelong thing, but but still, if we have to manage. So, so I would be interested in knowing your view. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think with everything in medicine, it's a balance, you know, and I think you you don't want to prioritize one tissue over another, but I think for us, the brain is absolutely the most critical tissue. 
And I mean, that really determines who we are as human beings. That's our entity, basically. And uh, I guess uh, from my perspective, I would be most concerned about the brain development. And with uh, GAMP deficiency, yes, absolutely. Um, giving creatine um, is helpful um, and giving ornithine and having an arginine and glycine, if possible, restricted diet will help to move the balance away from the accumulation of guanidino acetic acid uh, and back down the other pathway down the agate pathway. And um, one of the um, cases that um, one of my colleagues whose main area of expertise and interest is the creatine deficiency disorders um, was a really, I thought quite a dramatic case uh, because this was um, about a 24 year old young man uh, who was identified to have GAA on urine screening and he was in one of these very large intellectual disability institutes. He was in residential care. And basically the videos showed him to be extremely dystonic and to have Mark drooling. He couldn't even close his mouth and he had no control over his hands. And he was basically wheelchair dependent. And he was started on this therapy. And about three to four months later, when he was videoed again, it was amazing because he was able to have his mouth closed without the drooling. His hands were no longer as dystonic and he was actually able to stack blocks. Now that may not seem like a great um, move forward, but in actual fact, you think if that young man had been diagnosed when he was an infant, he may never have <laughs> developed that phenotype altogether. So I think it is very important to you know, look at what we can do to intervene. And obviously if someone has developed, uh, it's renal stones, oxalate yeah. renal stones. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would get the nephrologist involved in terms of they have various uh, therapies also for trying to reduce stone accumulation, et cetera. But that's certainly very important. You wanna make sure the kidneys continue to function yeah, well, uh, you know, but uh, everything in medicine is a balance, you know, too little isn't good, too much isn't good. You want to be in that nice homeostatic middle zone, which is, yeah. you know, what normal metabolism centers around. So uh, it, it is not easy. Um, as far as the molybdenum and cofactor deficiencies, I don't have a great deal of experience because I, I'm not I, I may have seen one case in 30 years, so I can't really make a um, an experienced comment about about that. Thank you so much, Willard. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, would you like to say something? Thank you, Dr. Shepali. Hi, Ingrid. Hi, Hassan, how I are really, you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your great presentation. Yeah, I also, I'm so happy to see you and then get the take home message about the treatable metabolic disorders in the early onset developmental epileptic encephalopathies. You know, during the our Congress time, we did a, a nationwide Turkish cohort study for early onset developmental epileptic encephalopathies, uh, 1400 uh, cases. We evaluated, evaluated the etiology uh, etiology specific diagnosis. When we look at this, this uh, cohort, uh, around 60% are uh, genetic cellular, cellular based, and 15% are in metabolic genetic, and 15% are genetic structural. You clearly mentioned that the real precision therapy is applied to the uh, treatable metabolic pathways in the uh, early onset developmental epileptic encephalopathies. Yes, we have some genetic uh, genetic uh, named developmental epileptic encephalopathies. We, we do some treat, uh, treatment modification, but it is not real precision. Real precision therapy just applied this group cases in the early onset developmental epileptic encephalopathies. My question about that, what is your expectation in the future the metabolic metabolomics is is in the in the in the front side or genomics in the in, in the front side of the uh, diagnostic evaluation side okay well that's a very uh, very good question um i think that um with uh, genetic testing 
you know, if if one has access to, let's say, rapid or ultra rapid whole exome uh, tr uh, trio whole exome sequencing, then that certainly um, increases, I think, quite significantly the yield of early diagnoses. However, uh, as I've said at the very end of my lecture, um, mm -hmm. uh, we are living in an age of uh, a tsunami of variants of uncertain significance. Uh, and that is oftentimes what we get back on our, on our whole exome sequencing. And then it's uh, critical for us to be able to say, does this fit the phenotype of the patient? You know, if it's a variant that really we don't have information on, we don't know how prevalent it is in the general population. We don't know if it's uh, for sure benign, possibly benign, BUS, possibly pathogenic or pathogenic. We can do our search on the ClinVar to see if that variant has been described before in someone who actually has a clinical disorder. But if we don't have that information, uh, then we can look at in silico analysis to see whether the prediction is that that variant could be a pathogenic mutation based on whether it changes the polarity or charge of the molecule or the binding of the molecule um, or the polarity of the molecule. Now, that may help us a little bit, but ultimately, we still have to go back to the patient. We still, and I will emphasize this over and over again, the clinician is still extremely important and even perhaps more important for trying to analyze whether this could be a possible pathogenic variant. And that depends on the clinical presentation that's carefully characterized, both the history as well as the examination, uh, the neuroimaging, the EEG, and the metabolic profile can certainly help there. Because if you see, for example, the accumulation of metabolites proximal to the block that that specific uh, genetic um, information suggests, then one can build a case for saying that this is likely a pathogenic variant in this patient. And then it's important to document and also to add to the literature, um, which, which can then be added to the ClinVar database to say that this, this particular variant does seem to be pathogenic. So I think that we cannot leave out our clinical phenotyping, our biochemical phenotyping, and that is, the biochemical phenotyping really is the metabolomic analysis. Um, so we can see what is not being produced, we can see what is being produced in excess, and then we can have a rational approach to the, let's say, uh, diagnostic, um, uh, let's say, uh, I would say precision medicine approach precision to that medicine. particular to that particular patient, and and perhaps in the future too, depending uh, on the specific mutation, there may also be very specific therapies that are targeted to that specific mutation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ingrid, for a uh, wonderful uh, talk. As usual, you are amazing. And uh, it's just a few questions we have. Uh, uh, there is a question uh, in, uh, by Denny uh, Sigardkai. In our country, we don't have 100 milligram IV peridoxin. Is it possible to give oral or tablet peridoxin with the same doses in non-responsive anti-seizure medication neonatal seizure? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think if, if you don't have intravenous, uh, at least one can give a try with oral. I'm not sure how quickly the effect would be seen, but if one does get an effect after the oral, as long as the child is able to absorb it, um, that would be the other thing. Oftentimes these children are very irritable and pyridoxin is also rather bitter. Um, so the important thing is to make sure that the pyridoxin is actually taken in and actually absorbed. And then one can see the effect. Uh, with the IV pyridoxin, you don't have a question. You're giving it directly intravenously, and then you can look at the response and clinically as well as on EEG. Um, so then you're guaranteed that they did receive the pyridoxin. Um, but that classic response we do see in some patients, but not in all. And you know that's where the continuation of let's say PLP with folinic acid until one gets that genetic diagnosis is important to prevent uh, or reduce the number of seizures which can then incur further neuronal injury. But I think we have to do the best we can with what we have. I think that's the bottom line. Absolutely, that's where we also start. 
One's not responsive, we start the other two <laughs> till we are waiting because it takes time, four to six it, weeks. And... It takes time. And, you know, not there are very few places in the world that can do this ultra rapid whole exome sequencing. Um, these, uh, there have been these projects in um, uh, University of California in San Diego, the Rady Children's Hospital that did ultra rapid whole exome sequencing in critically ill children in PICUs and NICUs. And Australia also did a similar sort of project. And you know they found that they certainly increased the yield of diagnoses in these patients, but it's a question of cost also, like what, what a different government can afford to do. Um, uh, they basically, I think, showed with their technology that they were able to save a lot of hospital days uh, by making those early diagnoses. And they were able to sort of justify the cost based on that. But it really depends on what facilities we have available. And I guess my major point here is that if you have the clinical suspicion that the child may have one of these vitamin cofactor responsive disorders, then it really is the clinical decision to go ahead and to give that clinical trial and to observe the effect. And if one does have an effect, well then definitely to continue until one gets the genetic confirmation one way or another. You know, early, early intervention, uh, this is where the clinician must be, must be engaged. Absolutely. In such critical situations, we can always give empirical. It's better to our own giving and then we can withdraw later. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. One, uh, uh, somebody has asked that uh, we can start uh, white, uh, white, uh, B6 in every seizure in infant origin phylactically. What is your opinion about it? Well, I, I still think that one should be directing these therapies towards uh, children who you think have a high um, possibility of having one of these uh, vitamin and cofactor dependent encephalopathies and seizures. And I think that we've developed some, some reasonable criteria to um, sort of be able to clinically select out those. Because if a child responds very well, let's say to phenobarb or Keppra or whatever it is that you're loading them with, then it seems they may not be as likely a candidate. If a child, for example, gets worse with phenobarb, diazepam, or chloral hydrate, then you should be thinking GLUT1 deficiency. <laughs> so um, I think, once again, we do have some guidelines now, and these were some of the guidelines that we developed with our metabolic epilepsy pa consensus panel, uh, where we had this meeting of metabolists and epileptologists from across Canada. And we developed, based on everybody's uh, combined experience, I think we had about 75 patients with pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy that we reviewed in the cohort. And that's how we developed um, a criteria of those who are, you know, high index of suspicion and those that may have been a bit atypical, but still warranted consideration of a pyridoxine-dependent condition. So that was published in 2011. And now I know more recently, the same group has published even further guidelines on these paradox and responsive epilepsies. So that's from so Sylvia only, Stockler. Yeah. So, so basically refractory cases, uh, uh, you know, yeah. where we don't have any yeah. investigations in that they should give. That's what uh, we have Indian guidelines also uh, for refractory, and also refractory. when there's no good when there's no good explanation. You know, if a child mm -hmm. has obvious hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or neonatal meningitis or you know some traumatic brain injury, uh, you know, at the time of delivery, then you may have uh, a clearly established etiology. Uh, for why they're having those seizures. But especially a child who begins to look encephalopathic, you know, they're irritable, they're sort of drowsy, they're not responding, they're not waking normally, and then they develop seizures. I think those are the ones that are highly suspicious. And obviously ones, ones that are entirely intractable, despite, you know, the usual loading that we would do in any child we thought may be in status epilepticus, and they're still seizing, for, the, for those children, for certain, I would definitely do these cofactor trials with PLP and folinic acid. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Ingrid, uh, we have a few cases, very brief ones uh, in the next 20 minutes. Uh, is that okay? okay. Yes, it's absolutely. Right. It'll be yeah, very yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So can we request uh, Dr. Sirup uh, 
from uh, Izmir, Turkey. She's from um, Katip Silibi University. I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. I hope it's okay. <laughs> Izmir, Turkey. And the uh, moderator would be Dr. Nihal. Uh, I'm just requesting everybody to please keep the cases and five minutes uh, and we request it for five slides, yeah? Because it's just priming everyone. And then we have three case spotters, which are only two slides each because we got six cases and we didn't want to say no to people. So we thought just it will be very brief presentations. And uh, I must tell you that many, uh, Dr. Ingrid, we, uh, the many of the titles have been uh, exotic. So I wanted to make note <laughs> down of the title. Sometimes, I don't know today's, I don't know, but I mean, many times they bring out with very, very exotic looking titles. Yeah, please. Sarah. Is it visible? Yes. So I'm going to present my case. Don't forget to check a magnesium level in every child present with seizure, otherwise it can be fatal. Uh, by the way, I am pediatric neurology consultant uh, from Health Science Institute, Bursa High Specialization and Training Hospital. Uh, the, uh, yeah. Magnesium is one of the most important electrolytes in infant, but it's often forgotten when it comes to evaluation of infant presenting with hypotonia and seizure. Its deficiency can present as a neurological, cardiac, and skeletal symptoms. Five months old girl infant presented with a febrile focal seizure. Here is the focal component of the seizure in our infant. She was born term for consanguineous family, normal antenatal follow-up with a history of a lost male infant who experienced first seizure on six month old and passed away on one year old due to unknown etiology 13 years ago. On examination, head circumference was 41.8 centimeters. Eye contact was a present, pupil or right reflex were normal, mild hypertonic, body temperature, 38.7.8 centigrade, experienced only once on approaching the emergency room, head control was present, and deep tendon reflexes, hypoactive plantar grasp was normal. The test result, hemoglobin was 8.3 anemic. The other component of the blood count was normal. Calcium, sodium, phosphate were normal, but the magnesium level was found to be low in the serum, 0.87 milligram deciliter, and the albumin was also low. The urine test, there was a protein loss in the urine, and the magnesium level in the urine was found to be so high, 3.6 milliequivalent per liter. EKG was normal, and it was conducted when the magnesium level was normal in that patient. Cerebral MRI showed mild ventricular asymmetry and hypomyelination. Cardiac echo tests were normal. The metricetam was started, and magnesium replacement was initiated immediately. So, to summarize up, infant presented with a seizure and hypomagnesemia and a history of lost sibling due to NN etiology, and the timing of the seizure was almost the same as her lost sibling. Something so serious should be behind this table. Article in PubMed were scanned for syndromes of 3B combination, mutation in TRMP7 and TRMP6 could be the reason behind their presenting table. Genetic analysis were asked and subsequently identified the abnormality as a homozygous gene mutation in TRMP7, confirming the diagnosis of familial hypomagnesemia. With a fewer than 100 cases reported in the literature, we aim to highlight the importance of early diagnosis and treatment initiated and create deeper understanding of these diseases. This is the genetic result of our patient showing the homozygous mutation. It could show uh, two patterns of inheritance, autosomal dominant, that associated with Parkinson and dementia, and autosomal recessive, that associated with familiar hypomagnesemia. The patient is now eight months old, and she can sit independently without any support. The seizure is under control with levetiracetam treatment. She receives oral magnesium replacement, and uh, for anemia, she receives sulfate treatment. Familial hypomagnesemia is a rare autosomal recessive genetic disease caused by transient receptor potential melastatin 7 genetic mutation. Any delay in the diagnosis and lack of timely initiation, the treatment can lead to long-term irreversible neurological complication and even death. Here, the general characteristic and the physiological function and the pathological function of tetrameric TRMP channel 
Uh, it's very fundamental in the cellular processes, including death, survival, proliferation, cell cycle progression, magnesium hemostasis, neuronal function, the oxidative stress response, tissue development, hypertension, and cancer development. Some studies have shown that TRMP play a vital role in cardiac fibroblast function and the process of cardiac fibroblast development. This is the first article that caught my eye when I scanned for PubMed for these three combination of symptoms. And one possible mechanism by which hypomagnesemia can induce seizure is still to be enhanced by brain inflammation and oxidative stress. Inflammation-induced oxidative stress and cell epiptosis have been reported uh, to contribute to seizure and brain injury. So my take-home message is don't consider each seizure with a fever as a febrile seizure. Don't forget to check for each electrolyte, including magnesium, Detailed family history and asking whether there is any lost infant is very crucial in the way to set the diagnosis. And here my reference. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will, uh, Dr. Nihal, want to say something? You. Uh, thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Sorry. For that, for that incredible case. And uh, I completely agree with you that you must check all of the electrolytes when you have someone with seizures. And uh, TRMP7 is a really important cation channel. And we know that magnesium is an important cofactor for a number of enzymatic systems. So um, uh, it's wonderful that you were able to detect that and then to be able to find the actual gene defect and the mu mutations in that child and how now you've had such a strong and important clinical response. Um, magnesium is also so important in the muscle for relaxation because it's, you know, in homeostasis with calcium, calcium, which leads to contraction, magnesium, you need to be able to relax muscles after contracting. Um, so, and obviously it has very important functions in the brain. So I think that's an excellent, excellent pickup. <laughs> so I congratulate you. Thank you so much. That will remain Thank in everybody's you. minds. <laughs> English Thank gets you. overlooked so many times. I mean, that is, is so critically important and it gets overlooked. Absolutely, times. absolutely. So Thank always you. add magnesium with your albumin and your calcium, as well as, as, well as all the other electrolytes. Excellent, excellent case. Thank you very much, Serap, and uh, all the other authors. Uh, I had also a similar uh, case uh, with same mutation. Um, it's very rare, uh, but easy to diagnose, you see. Um, we have to check all electrolytes you set uh, at the first seizure, whatever the etiology. Uh, it's easy, but... Um, good case. <laughs> it's easy to treat also. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful case. Wonderful case. Dr. Kura, have any comments? Dr. Hassan, any comments? Then otherwise we go to Dr. Javeria. Dr. Hassan? No, just only uh, congratulations for the setup. I really enjoyed the cases. And then when initially uh, first time he, she presented to, uh, the case to me, I really am really excited that this is the, my first time to see this this kind of uh, familial hypomagnesemia. I really enjoyed that. Then I suggested to present here. Uh, congratulations, Sarah. Thank you, Ingrid, for your comments. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Hassan, for always uh, having Turkey present. Really, very really grateful. Uh, Dr. Zaviria? Now it's all yours. Uh, am I audible? All good. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, good morning. Um, I am thankful to the AOCN uh, for uh, letting us present uh, at this forum. So I'm going to be quick with my presentation. Um, so it's about a three and a half years old male uh, child who presented in the emergency with complaints of uh, fever for 13 days and focal left sided chronic seizures and focal deficit for one day. This was associated with few episodes of vomiting, and later he ha had obtendation, uh, which was not associated with any visual disturbances, any other cranial neuropathies, urinary or fecal incontinence, any preceding history, any parallel rash, arthritis, or any TB contact. Uh, he was a developmentally age-appropriate boy who was vaccinated as per age with no significant past history. The only history was that he was born to consanguineous parents, and his 
first girl sibling uh, at around eight months of age expired because of acute event of encephalopathy, which was associated with stroke, and the cause was not a certain in this case. Uh, so he came in the ER with a GCS of 12 by 15. There were uh, localizing signs to the left side with power of 3 by 5. All the reflexes were generalizedly brisk. Left plantar was upgoing, rest of the cranial nerves and neurological examination was normal, including the fundus. The general physical and the systemic examination was fairly normal. So uh, three and a half years coming in with fever, vomiting, seizures, deficit, obtendation uh, was thought of being meningitis with complications or uh, considering stroke, we also thought of vasculitis and some demyelination. So an urgent CT brain was done. If you can see on the CT brain that there are some hypodense areas in the right hypo hyperitial areas. Other than that, the ventricular system and the deeper structures, they appear fairly normal. So an immediate LP was done in the ear and it showed TLC of 10 with 20% polys and normal protein and sugar. The hemogram was within normal limits and later the cultures also came out to be negative. He was started off IV antibiotics along with neuroprotections and anti-epileptics and there was improvement in terms of a seizure control and conscious level until we had an MRI also that was planned. If you see this first MRI of this child on T1 weighted images, there is effacement in the cervical guidance pattern on the right hyperitial areas. And uh, on the T2 weighted images, um, there are the same findings are over there, except for that there are some hyper intense globus pallidus as well, and some hyper intensities in the midbrain as well. Uh, so initially the child was improving in the first seven days, but then he had a dip in his GCS to eight by 15. And they were uh, worsening in the focal deficit of the power of the left side to one by five. So an immediate repeat imaging was done to see the progression of the disease. And these are the T1 uh, weighted images plane uh, in which we can see the uh, hemorrhagic infarct, which are causing mass effect and supratentorial shift. And along with that, there's also a hemorrhage in the right medial cerebellum. Uh, so this is a contrast image. And uh, in the contrast image, you can appreciate that there is an empty delta sign, which is actually signifying thrombosis. These are the T2 weighted and these are the uh, DWI images, which are showing the hemorrhagic infarct with mass effect and supratentorial shift. Uh, so we reviewed the diagnosis. This is the report of MRI. So we reviewed the diagnosis that a uh, age-appropriate child came in with encephalopathy, having a initial improvement in encephalitis covered, but later deteriorated with MRI showing hemorrhagic infarcts, mass effect, metabolic area involvement, and then another sibling who had a similar history and diagnosed uh, was not diagnosed and uh, rather expired. So we planned extended neuro workup for this child, including metabolic and uh, uh, angiography and venography. So in geography were fairly normal, all the vessels, while the venography showed a uh, significant narrowing in the sagittal, sides, uh, sagittal sinus uh, throughout, more on the anterior portion, as well as the left uh, right transfers more than the left one. So this signifying thrombosis and he was immediately started on anticoagulation. Uh, meanwhile, the stroke workup was negative. The metabolic workup that came in was showing high uh, levels of methionine, which were four times with decrease in the cysteine and peak of homocysteine levels. Uh, the homocysteine level was actually 308, which signifies that it is it comes under the severe range. The cobalamin levels were normal. Uh, so along with the anticoagulation that was started, uh, we uh, start, immediately started the high-dose redoxin, uh, folic acid, cobalamin, and anti-epileptics. The child improved uh, in terms of fully regained conscious level, improvement of the focal deficit, and he was discharged with an MRS score of 3. The second issue that we faced, uh, faced on follow-up was the persistent hypertension, which was not initially present. And the workup for renal cause, cardiac cause, renin, angiotensin, all was normal. And we had to start him on antihypertensive, uh, 5 mg femlodipine with the fair control of blood pressure. And to rule out the cause of this hypertension, we got a CT angioabdomen, which, act which actually showed a chronic thrombosis of the IVCs, the bilateral ileic veins, and the left main renal artery, leading to multiple collateral formation. Uh, so we diagnosed this child as a case of homocysteinuria with multi-system thrombosis, not only limited to the CNS, but also to the systemic vessels. Uh, but with treatment with anticoagulation, uh, high-dose pyridoxine, uh, later on started on betaine also, the child became fully ambulatory uh, with MRS score of zero. Uh, the blood pressure was fairly controlled, but now rather has we have reduced the dose of amlodipine. Uh, the anti-epileptics have been reduced to monotherapy from polytherapy, and we have continued the uh, uh, vitamins, especially high-dose pyridoxine. 
This is just a chart that is showing when he came in with the homocysteine of 308 with an MRS and 5 and complete thrombosis of multiple sinuses now to uh, level of 103, which is still high, but uh, there is thrombosis of only the anterior portion of sagittal sinus and the clinical uh, score is much more improved. Uh, so just uh, for classical homocysteinuria, because hemethonin are very high in our case, uh, because in remethylation they are very low. Uh, pertaining to this case, uh, because he has extensive thrombosis, uh, so we reviewed some articles and uh, in this article we found that this, this was a case series of CVST as the first manifestation of homocysteinuria. There were six patients uh, ranging from this age group, all had high homocysteine levels of more than 300. And they were anticoagulated for six to 12 months along with vitamin administration. And they say that vitamin administration actually results in significant reduction of the risk of vascular events, including the thrombo thromboembolic events. Our case has now received 18 months of anticoagulation along with the vitamin uh, administration. And uh, there is still some thrombosis in the uh, CNS while we are awaiting the CT uh, veno uh, angiovenography of the abdomen. But uh, there is significant improvement after we have started all this. Uh, so this is all about my case. Um, any questions and suggestions? And I would just uh, want to have this advantage of asking that in such cases with thrombosis and homocysteinuria, how long should we give anticoagulants? Thank you very much. Thank you for the amazing case, Professor Ingrid. Beautifully presented case, I must say. Uh, and such a dramatic presentation and such a dramatic response to your therapy. I congratulate you because you really ended up with um, uh, a malignant infarct with that degree of cerebral swelling. And uh, you obviously really um, retrieved this patient uh, in terms of the neurological profile from one out of five plus power to four out of five plus. That's, that's really uh, a tremendous result. And uh, I congratulate you, uh, you know, for documenting that severe venous sinus thrombosis uh, in the brain and then subsequently in the renal arterial system. That is um, a really wonderful uh, investigation, I would say. Um, in terms of um, uh, the anticoagulation, what was it that you were using for the anticoagulation? Uh, initially, uh, we uh, kept the child on uh, enoxaparin. Uh, then we had shifted him to warfarin, but now we are giving him uh, rivaroxaban. Okay. All right. So uh, I think that uh, from my perspective, this is where I would reach out to our stroke people, you know, to ask, to have some guidelines in terms of how long, given these two really important uh, thromboses this child had, how, how long one should continue that, uh, because that's really in the realm of their experience in treating venous sinus thromboses, um, because that's a, a different part of the system, right? You're giving the child good metabolic therapy to get those homocysteine levels down. So you're doing the best that you can from the metabolic point of view, but this hypercoagulability state is um, another part of the treatment regimen. And I would okay. certainly reach out to, to the stroke people to get to get their uh, experience in terms of the treatment of, of these sorts of vascular events in homocystinuria. Right. So, but you've, you've done mm -hmm. a, an incredible job. The other sibling of this child actually passed away. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Are there any other siblings that need to be screened in this family? He, uh, yeah, they have, she, he has two siblings and uh, we have screened them. Uh, their levels are normal. We have just oh, gotten their goodness. levels. Okay. Thank goodness. Okay. Thank you. Thank Very you. dramatic case, beautifully presented and um, excellent management, I have to say. Thank you so much. Dr. Kurat, do you want to say any, anything before we go to the next case? Uh, yes. Uh, so I would say that Javeria has very eloquently described and concisely presented the case. And it is always a very good feeling to see your patient clinically improving, especially in a resource-limited country in which we have uh, limited resources and cost issues. But I would just like to wrap up the case by sharing my experience of working as a clinical trials fellow at GOSH. So uh, I had uh, the chance to work as a clinical trial fellow, and we worked on the uh, uh, Pectrivillis alpha. Uh, it is actually a genetically engineered enzyme, uh, which is a form of a novel therapy and which is 
uh, which was tried to see the breakdown of homocysteine. So, so we uh, tried that on two siblings, and and uh, uh, the study was completed in 2023, and still we are waiting for the results. So, it is always good to see the brighter aspect of the picture, and the novel therapies are underway other than the conventional therapy. This is what I want. Absolutely, and that's why you see we have different resource settings pro, uh, professionals here, so that that gives you the diversity to you know the discussion to yeah. be more interesting. But Dr. Ingrid can have the last word before we go to the next case. Anything more you want to say? No, I I just yeah. congratulate Dr. Alvi for her management of this patient. Really, thank you so much, Dr. Komal Atri. Can you uh, share your slides, please, Komal Atri? From RML Hospital, in Delhi. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You do it. We are actually running short of times. So next five minutes finish. Yeah. We'll focus on the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less on the discussion. Yeah, yeah. Please. please. So this is a case of recurrent encephalopathy, neurorecreation, and epilepsy. We have a five-year-old male child. Known case of post encephalitic sequelae with epilepsy presented to emergency in gasping state. And uh, after primary assessment, we uh, found that the child was in cardiorespiratory failure and the primary resuscitation was provided in the emergency. And then child was shifted to PICU. After shifting to the PICU, these are the vitals of the child. And on anthropometry, the child was found to be failure to thrive. So in PICU, the child was intubated in view of respiratory failure, but uh, on day six of uh, admission, he was extubated. And the, uh, coming to the cardiovascular system, he was received in shock for which he received vasoactive support and antibiotics. And shock endpoints were achieved within 24 hours. And later on, all the vasoactive support was tapered and stopped. So to summarize, we have a five-year-old male child born out, out of non-consanguineous marriage, second in birth order. There was a developmentally normal till two years of age and since then admitted three times. In first admission, he was diagnosed as meningoencephalitis with seizure disorder and was discharged on valproate and clobazam. And in second admission, he came with irritability and aggressive behavior, again discharged on anti-epileptic drugs. And in third admission, he came with status epilepticus and was discharged on valproate. This time, child presented with loose stools and vomiting and altered sensorium for two days. So based on the history, what all the possibilities we can think of? First, it could be a post-encephalitic sequelae with sepsis with valproate toxicity or an epileptic encephalopathy or it could be inborn error of metabolism with uh, acute crisis. So for, to confirm the diagnosis, we uh, planned some investigations. CBC and CRP came out to be normal and the biochemistry of the child was also normal. In blood gas, we found mixed picture of respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. RBS of the child was normal and ke urine ketones were negative. Ammonia and lactate levels were high for which we planned TMS, GS, GCMS and MRI brain and EG was also planned. In this blood gas, we can see there is a mixed respiratory alkalosis picture with metabolic acidosis and high ammonia lactate levels. And this MRI brain of the child is showing cerebral atrophy. So um, as we have high um, hyperammonemia and high lactate levels, we are thinking more in the lines of inborn errors of metabolism. And we can think of urea cycle defects, mitochondrial disorders or organic acidemias. As we also have respiratory alkalosis in the blood gas, so it is more pointing towards the urea cycle defects. And to confirm the diagnosis, TMS, GCMS was sent. The second possibility was of uh, epileptic encephalopathy for which EEG and MRI brain was planned. And there was no epileptiform uh, discharges in the EEG. And the third possibility was of post-encephalitic sequelae with sepsis with valproate toxicity for which the uh, sepsis screen of the patient came out to be negative and LFTs were normal. So this is the trends of the ammonia and lactate of the child when he was admitted with us. So valproate was stopped on day one and feed was introduced on day three of admission and he was started on multivitamin supplements and TMS, GCMS was sent. On day six of admission, as we can see, the ammonia and lactate levels were again high so uh, on six days, the child was extubated and we kept the child nil per oral with uh, sodium benzoate, arginine and mitochondrial cocktail was started. 
so on day 9 we can see the ammonia and the lactate levels are again in the normal range the child was continued on nil per oral sodium benzoate arginine and mitochondrial cocktail was continued and till that time tms gcms report came tms was showing low or nothing levels and gcms was negative so now we have hyperammonemia in this case and blood gas showing no acidosis rather respiratory alkalosis and normoglycemia so these all are pointing towards urea cycle defects we have sent a repeat tms and gcms and hplc and whole exome sequence of the child was planned and tms report was suggestive of low arginine and ornithine levels and hplc was showing elevated glutamine and glycine levels with low arginine which is pointing towards lysinuric protein intolerance child was continued on low protein diet with sodium benzoate arginine and there was no seizure recurrence in the child so to summarize there were high ammonia levels on starting feeds and ammonia levels improved on uh, when child was kept on low protein diet with sodium benzoate so we have hyperammonemia respiratory alkalosis and hplc showing high glycine glycine and glutamate levels and decreased arginine levels with tms showing low arginine and ornithine levels and whole exome sequence showing slc7 a7 gene mutation on exon 4 and exon 2 which is pointing towards lysinuric protein intolerance so we came up with the final diagnosis of lpi with hyperammonemic crisis so the take home message from this is recurrent uh, if we have recurrent encephalopathy we have to think about iens individually they may be rare but collectively not uncommon and diagnosis reside in simple clinical cues with simple biochemical investigations early initiation of therapy always came out with a better prognosis and timely diagnosis and early intervention prevents a reversible disorder from becoming irreversible thank you to be joy uh, yes uh, in fact i must thank uh, the organizer to give me the opportunity and i must uh, i am so happy that to professor in great is here and it is a pet topic for her and uh, with simple measures like screening measures at the at emergency and simple observation that uh, uh, keeping the child nil orally and uh, so decreases ammonia and when re on re reintroduction of feed the child had again ammonia So, uh, on second day, third day, we started multivitamin, and uh, towards the sixth, sixth day, we assumed that we are probably we are dealing with a urea cycle disorder. And on uh, sixteenth day, when the uh, uh, HPLC report came, we were thinking that uh, probably we are dealing with a lysinuric protein intolerance. And subsequently, it was confirmed by the whole exome sequencing, and that is the story of this child. And the child is now nine years old. He came to us at five years. and i was wondering what can you do for the growth the child came with a height of 106 cm and his chin is not growing and his bone is also still delayed as he is still hovering around 4 years okay i yeah, i had a little bit of difficulty hearing um uh, but you're asking about uh helping the growth in this child is that right yes, yeah yes so mm-hmm. yeah so generally we have our uh metabolic dietitians you know analyze the diet of the child very carefully and um you know do uh, a proper like a good you know, extensive sort of nutritional screening to make sure that they have the adequate amounts of vitamins and minerals etc in their diet um and also to um provide input into uh, i mean obviously here you have to restrict um proteins so giving input into uh what other sort of higher caloric uh content you can in you can put into the diet to uh promote the growth of the child without causing uh, a relapse of um of the sort of catabolic crisis that occurs because of the urea cycle disorder uh, but generally we get our metabolic dietitians uh deeply involved and they regularly then um you know follow all the metabolic parameters as well as the dietary parameters in the child and and try to optimize uh the diet to help promote growth in children um it's 
very common that children with inborn errors of metabolism uh, often have failure to thrive and low growth. And that is certainly a continuing concern that we have. But I think it's, again, very important to make sure that they have, you know, good vitamin D levels, good calcium intake, important for the bones. And, um, uh, you know, again, very specific deficiencies that can sometimes occur on these diets. Um, that's what needs to be looked at very carefully. Uh, and supplemented um, so that they don't end up having, you know, a specific vitamin or uh, essential cofactor deficiencies. Um, I thank you very much for this case. I think whenever you have these unexplained recurrent encephalopathies, it's really important to consider an inborn error of metabolism, no question. And, you know, of those certainly mitochondrial disorders, uh, fatty acid oxidation disorders with recurrent hypoketotic hypoglycemic encephalopathy, and urea cycle disorders with recurrent hyperaminemia are very critical to, uh, to consider within that, as well as organic acidurias that can also decompensate. Um, the, uh, when I saw the valproic acid, as I was listening to the story of these recurrent encephalopathies, I, I had fear <laughs> because... Um, we've shown that uh, valproic acid can certainly tip these children over uh, because it is, uh, in essence, uh, uh, certainly a very um, second most commonly used anticonvulsant, very effective, but it is a mitochondrial toxin. So definitely something that one would try to avoid at all costs in children with a suspected inborn error. And we've shown in our studies that um, uh, valproate inhibits carnitine uptake at the uh, carnitine transporters so they can become carnitine deficient. And if they become significantly deficient, then that also starts to limit long chain fatty acid oxidation uh, because carnitine is an essential cofactor for long chain fatty acid oxidation. We also know that valproate can, um, it's, it's actually 3-propyl 5-pentanoic acid. So it's a medium chain uh, fatty acid. So it can go into the mitochondria and inhibit MCAD, medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase, because it's mimicking octanoate. And so it can inhibit also medium chain fatty acid oxidation. And we know that the formation of valproyl carnitine esters uh, can cause carnitine loss through the kidney uh, because it competes for the octin 2 transporter. And relatively, you get higher absorption of the valproyl carnitine with loss of free carnitine. We also know that it can combine to CoA, and CoA is a huge molecule that is um, sequestered in mitochondria and in the cytosol. It can't move across membranes. And if valproate combines to the CoA, it reduces CoA, which is an important cofactor for beta oxidation and for a number of other bioenergetic cycles. So once again, it's limiting energy homeostasis. And we also know that valproate can form two, four diene valproate metabolites, which can be hepatotoxic. So there we have, you know, five possibilities for valproate causing cellular dysfunction. And finally, valproate can inhibit carbamyl phosphate synthase, which is a, an important urea cycle enzyme, which then uh, can promote further hyperaminemia. So I think that that's a really excellent case because it highlights how if you have a suspicion of an inborn error of metabolism, especially one of intermediary metabolism that involves bioenergetics, uh, one really has to consider removing the valproate and using uh, another anti-epileptic that does not have these same um, uh, sort of metabolic consequences. So um, uh, carnitine levels in this child would be something else that I would definitely check uh, because um, uh, that is very important in heart, in muscle, and in brain. Um, so in brain, it um, serves as a donor for acetyl groups to choline acetyl transferase for cholinergic neurotransmission. And in the heart and the muscle, it's very important for long chain fatty acid oxidation, which is long chain fatty acids provide us with the greatest energy in those two tissues. So I would check the carnitine concentrations in this child, uh, because if they are low, then that would be something else that might be given to the child to help to promote the growth and the development, both in the brain, the heart and the muscle. Carnitine is important really in all tissues. Um, but I think that this, this is a very instructive case for, uh, for certain. And I thank you for that presentation.
Thanks, thanks a lot. In fact, uh, this child actually, the TMS that we are getting the reports that also improve carnitine and we have supplemented the child on day two with, uh, with multivitamins and carnitine. And okay, so, yeah. <laughs> all right. So you're so you're already on the on, on yeah, a yeah. good course to help to stimulate this child's growth. So uh, I think it's tincture of time. And um, yeah. as I said, um, uh, very, um, you know, careful analysis of the nutritional status of the child. Uh, we do a, a large battery of tests um, through our GI nutrition people. And, you know, when we see deficiencies, then those ch children get supplemented with those. And, and hopefully that will improve the growth of this child. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you uh, for a wonderful case presentation and wonderful discussion. Sangeeta, can you please uh, get the next three spotters done in the next five to seven minutes? Sure. Sangeeta? Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Komal. Uh, we can move on to the next spotter session. Uh, the first presentation would be by Dr. Amresh Rai. And Dr. Vaigunta Raju would be the moderator for the session. You can make it full screen and you can start your presentation. It, it is visible. Dr. Amrish, are you there? There is any issue, Amrish? You can uh, stop sharing the screen and share again. Asmita, can you guide? Because we are anyway running short of time. Something is wrong with the connectivity. He had shared Hello? and seen before. Yeah, uh, start off, Amrish. Yeah. Am I audible, ma'am? Now, yes. yes, but third slide is seen. Make it first. Amrish, we have crossed the time actually. Can you make it first slide with and full screen? Yeah. Thanks. We can start presenting. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, so, Dr. Amrish, uh, pediatric neurology fellow from Indira Gandhi. I am going to present uh, uh, four cases. Now, this is the first case. This is a 16 year old male child from Bangalore, hailing from Bangalore. This is a came uh, with a developmental delay since birth, with a history of uh, slow and broad based clumsy gait, with distal weakness in the upper limbs, uh, with wasting in the legs, with slippage of the sandals. So, notice since last two to three years, with failure to gain weight, with recurrent episodes of dengue like illness, with mild to moderate thrombocytopenia, with vomiting, with headache, associated with fever. On exam, the child was having knuckle hyperpigmentation bilaterally with peace cavus deformity, with twisting of the thinner and hypothenar eminence. Anthropometry was showing a low BMI with a small head of 50.5 cm head circumference. Examination of high mental status was within normal limit. These uh, pictures of this child is showing color with uh, knuckle hyperpigmentation bilaterally with peace cavus deformity, the foot. On exam, the calves, the mild scale wasting, both upper and lower, uh, with incomplete closure of the eyes during sleep, and there is atrophy of the papilla over the dorsum of the tongue. Cerebral signs, uh, dysmetria was present. Sensory system examination was showing impaired vibration and joint position sensation. Examination of the motor system was showing uh, decreased uh, muscle bulk distal in the lower limb and also in the upper limb symmetrically. And there was presence of significant dystonia with spasticity, but it was dystonia was more predominant than spasticity. DTR was uh, the brisk in the bilateral knee with one plus DTR in the bilateral ankle. And uh, other examination uh, showing extensive plantar response uh, and uh, dystonia, dystonic tremor of the both hands. Uh, this child actually came with uh, thrombocytopenia, and this child uh, had a significant uh, improvement of after treatment uh, with uh, some supplements. And this was the MRI of this child after uh, admission. It was showing bilateral symmetrical uh, T2 hyperintensity in the periventricular and deep white matter, along with restricted uh, diffusion. 
along with presence of arachnoid cyst in the mid, uh, middle cranial fossa, along with some uh, hypertensity in the posterior putamen. <clears throat> so the child uh, was evaluated uh, with lactate of 36 uh, with ammonia of 88. CPK was significantly high of, of one, 1,996, low vitamin B12 and homocysteine. Failed rate count was 78,000 on admission, but it gradually improved with treatment, which sent TMS suspecting organ, uh, suspecting some immunodeterminant of metabolism. It was showing uh, uh, C2 and uh, C0 content. You know, GCMS was sent suspecting organic acid urea, which was showing elevated 3 hydroxy glutaric acid level. NCS was uh, done that time, which was showing demyelinating type of neuropathy, both upper and lower limb. Then uh, the child was discharged with oral L carnating, hypoflavin, and vitamin B12 supplement with low protein diet, suspecting some inborn error of metabolism with underlying nutritional and vitamin B12 deficiency. Whole exome was sent, whole exome was showing. And uh, GCDA gene mutation or homozygous autosomal recessive likely pathogenic. This is the child after uh, three months of follow-up. The child was uh, walking with some dystonic gait. There is some uh, dragging of the left leg while walking and this slow. The child was not able to run fast compared to his other siblings. There is, and there is some slowness of the gait. And uh, there was significant improvement of the dystonic tremor of the hands. So repeat, uh, the child was repeat TMS was sent after three months of course of vitamin B12 with flavin and protein and with protein restricted diet, which was showing elevated 3 hydroxy uh, calentine level, which was uh, in favor of our diagnosis. And uh, just then the child was diagnosed with uh, glutaric acid type 1 with nutritional vitamin B12 deficiency with uh, recurrent thermocytopenia with uh, demyelinating peripheral neuropathy. This is the second case. Uh, this child presented uh, in our OPD with a uh, uh, history of 21 month old male child born to third degree consanguineous married couple with insignificant parental history with the developmental delay with acute regression of the atal milestone following an episode of uh, loose stool at, at the age of 18 months. On presentation, the child had uh, recovered some milestones with partial neck control was, uh, was there on examination. Uh, the child was sitting without support, immature pintle gasp was present. On examination, there are small head with failure to thrive with the right eye on non paralytic isotropia. On examination of the motor system, there is generalized wasting with sluggish DTR with extensive plantar response with uh, significant odomandibular and uh, appendicular dystonia with spasticity. The child was also evaluated uh, with uh, uh, in the line of inborn error of metabolism and just showing a low pre carnitine level with elevated glutalic with elevated glutalic carnitine level. And this child, uh, MRI was showing hyperintensity in the bilateral deep white matter and periventricular white matter with T2 hyperintensity in the bilateral putamen with prominent extraxial CSS species in the bilateral sylvian fissure in the, in the frontotemporal region. Because of uh, this tigoid appearance of the white matter, we uh, also sent uh, serum aryl sulfatase A to look for uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, which was, uh, came low. So we sent whole exome to confirm our diagnosis, which came uh, positive for both metachromatic leukodystrophy as well as progrotic acidoid type 1. And... Uh, Segregation and analysis was sent for the parents to confirm uh, this diagnosis, which was showing both the uh, genes of the parents were uh, heterozygous. Uh, the uh, heterozygous carrier was there uh, of the both the parents. This is the uh, picture of the child, uh, which was uh, presented on uh, 21 months of age uh, with uh, developmental disease with dystonia with spasticity. And this is the MRI of this child, uh, which is showing frontotemporal atrophy with uh, bilateral striatal T2 hyperintensity. And this is the uh, NCS of this child, which is showing a uh, demyelinating type of peripheral neuropathy. So this is the final diagnosis of this case. Uh, it's a developmental delay uh, with uh, acute post-infectious regression of milestone with partial catch-up of all milestone with uh, oromandibular dystonia with perimental signs peripheral neuropathy uh, with failure to thrive secondary to glutaric acid type 1 with metachromatic leukodystrophy. Uh, so this is the publication of this case. This is the third case. Uh, this is the uh, six month old male child with normal birth history presented with developmental delay with large head and dystonia. The child was. Uh, Dr. Amrish, Dr. Amrish uh, it was supposed to be a spotter, very brief. We have two more. Can you please just uh, give messages okay. from this? Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, this child had a uh, normal pitan B12 level with homocysteine, normal homocysteine level on evaluation. And the neuroimaging was showing bilateral temporal atrophy with prominent sylvian fissure uh, of, of classical of glutaric acid or type 1. And this child was treated as per the protocol of diabetes and low protein diet and carnitine supplement. And uh, 
this whole exome was sent, uh, which is also uh, in favor of butyric aciduria. And the child was having normal uh, catch up of the development. Uh, the child was sitting without support, uh, and child was crawling. The child was responding to his name. With, uh, but there is a gradual loss of atlan milestone at 16 months of age. And that time the child was evaluated and uh, the child was, uh, so, and the, on examination, this, there was hyperpigment, hyperpigmentation of the knuckles of the hands with dystonia of the upper limbs with uh, elevated homocysteine level and low vitamin B12 level. So after that, the child started on vitamin B12 supplement and the child showed significant improvement within two to three weeks. This is the MRI of the child. He's showing bilateral global failure to C2 hyperintensity with frontotemporal atrophy because of Rhetoric aciduria, acid but the child uh, had significant improvement with the uh, supplement. But at later age, the child uh, had re regression of milestone because of uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. So, this is the child, uh, which is uh, of the picture of the child on second evaluation, which is showing nacal hyperpigmentation because of vitamin B12 deficiency. And the child started on vitamin B12 supplement. After that, the child recovered, uh, the child started to have recovery of the milestone, and the child gradually again started to sit without support. This is the all picture of the child uh, showing gradual improvement of the motor milestones. And this is the population of this case. Uh, it's a reiterable complication of the regression of the glutaric acid type 1. So this is the final diagnosis of this case. Uh, is a baseline GDD with uh, gradual loss of my atom milestone followed by catch-up with dystonia with large head knuckle hyperpigmentation. Second diet, a glutaric acid type 1 with nutritional epidemic visual deficiency. So these are the uh, summary of this, all these three cases. Uh, <clears throat> this is my last case. Uh, the infantile, this child actually presented uh, with infantile tremor syndrome uh, initially. And uh, the, at, uh, this child initially presented with infantile tremor syndrome at 16 months of age. And uh, this child actually having infantile tremor with dystonia. So MRI was done. Uh, MRI was showing bilateral T2 uh, hyperintensity in the global spelled with detected diffusion along with a large head, uh, along with some knuckle pigmentation and uh, sparse hair. So who is uh, suspected as a glutaric aciduria type 1 in this child also because of some uh, large head with such significant uh, T2 signal changes in the uh, striatum as well as in the brainstem as well as in the midbrain. So we sent whole exome, but whole exome came negative. As, and this child also later was diagnosed as vitamin B12 deficiency and because the mother was completely purely vegetarian. And uh, we started supplement with vitamin B12, and the child significantly responded with vitamin B12 with uh, with uh, catch up of the developmental milestones. So this is the conclusion: uh, glutaric acid type one peripheral neuropathy with underlying nutrition etiology should be suspected in all cases of glutaric acid type one if there is uh, no improvement uh, because of uh, because of underlying vitamin B12 deficiency. And uh, early cognition and prompt treatment helps to achieve improvement of the developmental outcome in all the cases. Thank you. Dr. Raju, briefly, can you make a comment? Yeah, so lack of time. So you should always consider a nutritional B12 deficiency when uh, the clinical picture is not correlating uh, in a typical with classical picture, as it can be in a manifestation of, uh, it can mimic like a glutaric acid, or it can be a complication of treatment with uh, strict, dietitian, uh, strict dietary restrictions. So you should always consider a B12 as a maybe a coincidence or it can be complication of treatment. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I think we always have to look for the possibility of certain uh, dietary deficiencies in children who end up on very restricted diets um, because of their inborn error of metabolism. And I think it's really important that we do look uh, at these vitamin levels like B12 and red cell folate um, and other, other vitamins also. Uh, because um, you can often have secondary deficiencies, which then end up adding to the neurologic phenotype and really expanding its, its expression. And these are all treatable entities. So I congratulate you for uh, identifying the, the B12 deficiency, given its role in the brain, the spinal cord and peripheral nerves. Uh, that's, um, uh, that's really very, very important. Uh, we, we have a similar situation, for example, in, um, I'll just give another example of a disorder that can have secondary vitamin deficiencies is 
um, long chain L3 hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase or LCHAD deficiency or trifunctional protein deficiency. Um, these children were placed on uh, very uh, long chain fat restricted diets um, because uh, it was trying to decrease the accumulation of long chain acyl CoA's, long chain acyl carnitines, which could be membranotoxic and could predispose to recurrent myoglobinuria. And because of the restriction in the diet, they became essential fatty acid deficient. Uh, and most notably in docosahexaenoic acid or DHA. And uh, this was something that actually contributed to the neuropathy as well as the pigmentary retinopathy because of the importance of DHA in synaptosomal membranes and also in retinal membranes. About 60% of the phospholipid is DHA. So once that was recognized, these children are now supplemented and those particular symptoms are, are to a large extent reversible. Uh, with the supplementation of essential fatty acids and particularly to consider DHA. So I think in any child with an inborn error of metabolism, uh, a very good nutritional screen looking at iron deficiencies, looking at zinc deficiencies, selenium, B12, red cell folate, and uh, you know uh, the whole list that goes down is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are running very late. Uh, Dr. Ingrid, you'll give five more minutes. I'll request the other two people. They were supposed to be spotters to just finish. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for nice case series, um, uh, Raju. Very nice. And uh, nice, yeah, nice presented, Amrish. Uh, Sunil, can you please uh, present and now requesting to have it only uh, very brief, you know, as we had requested the spotters to be very, very brief. Yeah. Dr. Sunil and Dr. Dasrita Ramayan. Good evening. Good evening. Today I am present newborn with active tense of labor. My primary mother with 38 weeks plus 3 days delivered through normal vaginal delivery at our hospital on 31st May 2024 at 120 a.m. Birth weight is 2.6 kgs. Baby cried immediately after birth. Lycor is clear. Abgar normal. Breastfeed started within one hour of birth. And day three of life, decrease activity, decrease acid, uh, acceptance of feed. On examination, baby was lethargic and significant weight loss present. Around 9%, septic scene were normal. RFT source, hyponative dehydration. Uh, IV fluids correction started. Within six hours of admission, uh, admission baby sensation was de deteriorated. Cosmodal and poor respiratory support, absent uh, brainstem reflex. And baby was intubated, antibiotics upgraded. Baby had one episode of seizure, injection of pinobum loading dose is given. This is video of the baby. Difference, uh, differential consolidated, severe sepsis with cardiac dysfunction, uh, EM with uh, marble uh, syrup urine disease or urocycle defect. Intercranial hemorrhage, brainstem encephalitis. In uh, NSG, so no intercranial hemorrhage, 2D echo is poor contactivity and middle one is started. VBG, respiratory met, um, uh, mode. Metabolic acidosis got normal within ventilation. In a uh, GILAC sample was sent, lactate was uh, 72 millipede decile, ketones is nil, serum ammonia is elevated, and uh, started uh, sodium benzoate and uh, allergens started. PMS sent on day four of life, uh, baby was still co uh, comatose, absent the brainstem reflex, people's dilate, not able to light. MRI was done, suggest of uh, diffuse cerebral edema. Extensive uh, patchy array, altered signal insensitivity in bilateral cerebral hemisphere, bilateral basal ganglia and midbrain. And day, uh, day five of life, baby was severe stuporous, people's reacted to light and dull side movement is present. Day six of life, baby was moderate stuporous, baby, uh, baby has blood in stools, septic scene was normal. Elevated SGOT and SGPT, PT and APPT prolonged in a INR is uh, deranged. We have given one FPP and vitamin K given. Repeat coagulation is INR is 2.3. We have given another one FPP and vitamin K given. Day 8 of life, repeat LFT was normal and coagulation profile is normal. And day 8 of life, baby sensor is improved, mild stuporous. Uh, we send TMS screen uh, uh, in this uh, test. 
the concentration of citrulline was subtermly above the normal. This is elevation associated with uh, arginine succinate synthase or arginine uh, succinate lyase deficiency. And the repeat ammonia level was decreased in 100. Uh, whole gene sequence and plasma minus starts, uh, reports are evaded. Day 9 of life, baby is expected and started feeds. Feeds increase gradually, reach full feeds and uh, day 14 of life. This is uh, after expiration the video of the book. Dr. Dasharitha, you're coming. Good evening, madam. Yeah, actually, this the baby had a severe uh, brainstem dysfunction with uh, people's director reacting react, not react to for almost three to uh, three days, three to four days. But uh, when uh, we reviewed, uh, it was uh, showing that we need uh, hemodialysis for such cases with elevated uh, hyperammonemia. But due to lack of resources, we just uh, waited without any protein supplementation and started on sodium benzoate and arginine. And baby sensorium gradually improved within three to four days. Thank you for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ingrid, your comments. Um, I think that one um, clinical clue for hyperammonemia that I would just like to mention is that if a child has metabolic acidosis, but respiratory alkalosis that is above the, the correction of that metabolic acidosis, one has to think about uh, some disorder that leads to hyperammonemia, most prominently the urea cycle disorders, because that elevated ammonia appears to be a very strong stimulus to the respiratory center in the medulla for this hyperventilation. And the other sign for hyperammonemia in the newborn is ophthalmoplegia. Uh, and we presume it's because it's using up alpha ketoglutarate in the Krebs cycle and thereby decreasing cellular anaplerosis and thereby decreasing energy in those dorsal gray stem nuclei of the brain stem that are so highly energy dependent. So if one sees a child in the NICU who has evidence of ophthalmoplegia and respiratory alkalosis that is an overcompensation over any metabolic acidosis they have, then the doing the ammonia will lead you down the right pathway in terms of investigations. And then, of course, there are a number of tests that one would do to uh, be able to uh, pinpoint which of those metabolic diagnoses it is. But that's, uh, I would say, from a clinical standpoint, that would be a clue that you have hyperammonemia. Thank you. Thank you so much for a nice case in the resource uh, limited situation and uh, the full comments. One well, last last uh, case, uh, Spotter Suthiraj, please come. It's very late, fast, and uh, Dr. Suthiraj and the comments from Dr. Pratim after that. That's his final case. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to present a short case on oplogary crisis as a manifestation of CNS neurotransmitter diseases. Uh, our case is a uh, Miss I, who is a three-year-old child from Bijno, who is a second uh, child of non-consanguineous marriage with uneventful perinatal period. Uh, she presented with complaints of global developmental delay, dystonic posturing, and abnormal movements of the eye in the form of episodic upward deviation of the eyes lasting for around three to four minutes, which was noticed since three months of age. On examination, she was noticed to have spasticity of all four limbs with hyperreflexia. This is just a video of the child. Here you can see that the child is having short, short duration upward deviation of the eyes of the bilater bilateral eyes. Uh, for this child, uh, we did an MRI brain, which was normal, and we also did a serum uh, tandem mass spectroscopy, which was also normal. We considered the possibility of CNS neurotransmitter defects, uh, other conditions like organic acidemias, uh, biotin diamond bi basal ganglia diseases, mitochondrial cytopathies, etc. Uh, due to financial constraint, we were not able to do a uh, serum among, uh, amino acid levels. However, we were able to do a, a clinical exome sequencing for free, which showed a homozygous missense mutation in the exon 5 of the GCH1 gene, leading to tetrahydrobiopterin deficient hyperphenylanemia, inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. 
uh, his uh, her serum prolactin levels were also high and we started the child on uh, phenylalanine free diet and uh, minimal dose of uh, levodopa with which the child clinically improved and currently we are trying to obtain a tetrahydrobioprin for the child Pratik, you have comments? I think it was your case, your present Pratik is not there. Then uh, we just have final comments from Dr. Ingrid on the case and take home messages for the attendees. Dr. Ingrid, uh, your comments on the case, and then you know we as a we um, request the speaker to give final take home messages. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, well. Uh, uh, a very uh, dramatic case that ocular gyric crisis absolutely uh, should lead one to think about a neurotransmitter defect. And um, uh, I, I guess in this case, it was the GTP cyclohydrolase 1 deficient dopa responsive dystonia. Um, so I, I must say that seeing all this uh, variety of cases that you have presented, uh, I'm impressed with um, uh, the complexity of the cases uh, which also have nutritional deficiencies associated with them. And I think that for me, that would be one of the biggest take home messages here uh, that um, one should always uh, be very alert uh, in children in whom we put on very special restricted diets that we keep an eye on their nutritional status and um, you know their basic, their vitamin cofactor mineral um, uh, levels uh, because we certainly want to be certain that we're supplementing them adequately uh, to promote uh, the best growth that they can possibly have. Um, I think, you know, and again, an overall message here would be that um, it's really important to, um, with, with all of our abilities now to do um, gene sequencing or whole exome sequencing, um, my, my biggest take home message is that the clinical phenotype and the biochemical profile are the two most important pillars to allow one to direct uh, one's, um, what should I say, genetic eye towards the correct diagnosis and, and to characterize um, perhaps a novel variant of uncertain significance as a pathogenic mutation, which can then be entered into the clinical variant database, which can then be extremely important for other um, clinicians and patients who discover these various variants. And um, I think that my final most important take home message would be the earlier you can diagnose something, um, especially in these bioenergetic defects that involve intermediary metabolism, the earlier you can make the diagnosis, the better the outcome for the child because a child who ends up with a severe encephalopathy or intractable seizures will obviously incur neuronal damage. And then there will be secondary injury, uh, which will then affect the intellectual development as well as the seizure control of, the, of that child. So once again, uh, it's really the astute clinical eye and the consideration of these vitamin and cofactor responsive encephalopathies is really critical for the child neurologist. If we don't think about it or pick it up, then it will be missed and, and we'll end up with a situation where the child may perish or may end up with very severe uh, intellectual disability and maybe ongoing intractable seizures. Um, so I think that would be probably the most important message that one can transmit. Uh, and I do congratulate you on the complexity of your cases and the, and uh, the diagnosis of these cases uh, in um, certain resource limited settings. It's very impressive um, uh, what diagnoses have been made and what treatments have been instituted. Uh, uh, and I guess one final point I would like to say is that understanding where the metabolic block is can help a great deal because if one can see uh, where the block is and what metabolites may be accumulating proximal to the block, one has therapies potentially for scavenging those uh, intermediates that can then cause secondary 
uh, dysfunction in other biochemical pathways. Um, we have this, and again, I'll use fatty acid oxidation disorders as these are the ones that um, um, I see a great deal of. Um, when we have short or medium chain fatty acid oxidation defects, so short and medium chain acyl-CoA metabolites we know can inhibit beta oxidation itself, can inhibit the urea cycle through inhibition of carbamyl phosphate synthetase. They can also inhibit pyruvate carboxylase leading to a certain small degree of lactic acidosis. And so scavenging those uh, is an important modality. In the long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, long chain uh, Acyl-CoAs become long-chain acyl-carnitines, which can be membranotoxic. So once again, um, trying to limit that production by having a low long-chain fatty acid diet uh, is really critical. And in certain disorders like trifunctional protein deficiency or VLCAD deficiency, the earlier that's instituted, the better it is for the prognosis for morbidity and mortality in the child. We also know that long-chain acyl-carnitines can be arrhythmogenic. So it's no small wonder that some of these children have very acute events from a cardiac standpoint. Um, so if we know what's accumulating and if we know what's becoming deficient that's distal to the block, then that may be something that we can supplement to bypass the block. So um, I think that a number of different strategies can be uh, thought about. There are also a number of disorders that have to do with um, like SCAD deficiency that has to do with protein misfolding. So there we might have therapies for improving protein folding using various antioxidants or chaperone therapies. So the more we understand about pathophysiology, the more we have the tools to think about how we can develop new strategies that can, um, let's say, improve balance um, in, in bioenergetic metabolism. And certainly with these cofactor and vitamin responsive conditions, uh, if they're transporter defects, giving larger amounts of that particular cofactor, like carnitine, for example, in the Octin-2 defect, has an enormous influence on reversing uh, the myopathy, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and also in limiting episodes of hypoketotic hypoglycemic encephalopathy. So I think um, understanding pathophysiology is the road to developing new precision interventional therapies that can have a very strong impact on the lives of these children and their families. So I think, I think that would be my final comment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Uh, very, very, I'm mean, really grateful for, you know, staying on so long. It extended. Actually, we had got six cases. Actually, I mean, we didn't want, we wanted to tell them briefly, but ultimately ended up so long. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nihal and Dr. Kurat, you want to add something of anything uh, with respect to your experience from Turkey and Pakistan? And then we wind up. Anything you want to add? Uh I believe you heard you have heard from you have heard from the best. Uh, so that is there in a well resourced thing. So if you want to add something which can be added as a rest, I mean the restriction or restraints what we have, that is all because otherwise uh, the the authority has given you the advice, the global authority. So I mean you can just tell you about restraints if you have constraints and restraints. Yeah, so I just want to uh, convey my take home message and I totally agree with Dr. Ingrid that uh, in metabolic it is all we and early pick that the this is what I all wanted to say, and congratulations to the team. Yeah, yeah. and what 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 Dr. Ingrid is saying about understanding the metabolism is important yes. because at various sites you can act on, and that can be a synergistic effect of having various sites. Like, yeah, I mean, so that's something really important. And I think what is deficiency in our countries is diagnosis is picking up. The idea is a holistic, uh, you know, follow up with the nutritionist uh, being monitoring because many of them, have, you know, those in, they have crisis, those intermittent ones, so they can be prevented. The growth and all can be monitored those nutritionist role uh, which is there you know there are few of them we have one but they, which is we have just been there after a long time we don't have that many metabolic uh, nutritionists there who are there I think close follow-up is missing with our side I don't know what about Pakistan and Turkey but here we have we have started having one but like you know but in the main uh, institutes only Yes, I would agree with you. And I think that uh, while it is equally important to have the neurometabolic physicians so the same is the importance for the dietitians. We need to have a trained dietitians because uh, metabolic specialists, they cannot work without dietitians. So I think absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think Nihal is more resourced. Yeah, Dr. Indeed, please. 
Yeah, I think it's um, with with our service in Toronto, they have four metabolic dietitians for the metabolics and genetic service. And they're extremely busy because they're monitoring, you know, let's say in the amino acidopathies, they're monitoring the serum levels all the time. And, you know, it's, I think uh, as an overall, it's the hardest thing is to modify someone's diet or someone's exercise. I think these are the two hardest things to change in any situation. And, you know, when you think about it, um, uh, I, 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 I have great sympathy for the children who are on the ketogenic diet, you know, whether it's for pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency or GLUT1 deficiency or for intractable epilepsy, because the diet is extremely strict. And when the child goes to school and someone offers them a candy, well, you, you know, the self-control not to accept a carbohydrate containing snack that everybody else is eating is very difficult. And um, I admire these families that are able to keep up with the restrictions of the ketogenic diet. And in a sense, the child can never then eat with the family uh, because unless they all go on the ketogenic diet. It's um, something that's very, very difficult to alter and to keep. And some of these children can easily go out of ketosis, even with the smallest amount of sugar and end up in status epilepticus. So it's it's something that I really admire in families who are able to do it. And uh, certainly in pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, it has a major impact on the neurological outcome. Um, and uh, they have to be very carefully monitored. They regularly get, um, you know, screening blood work every four to six months to look at all their nutritional levels, basically of all of the minerals and vitamins and essential cofactors to ensure that they're not becoming deficient. Also not in magnesium. <laughs> I will mention that too. Um, so it's, there's a whole host of uh, metals that are looked at to ensure their copper, their zinc, their selenium, uh, manganese, all of these, that uh, the diet is not leading to a deficiency state with secondary neurological consequences. So I, I really, I have to admire your abilities to make these diagnoses and also to detect on top of that secondary nutritional issues. And that's something we must always keep in mind. Thank you. Nihal, anything from Turkey? Then we close. Yes, uh, thank you very much for invitation. Um, we see very, very excellent uh, cases and we learn again, again. <laughs> um, we have some sources, but we have a lot of patients in uh, Turkey. Uh, so uh, these sources, uh, are not uh, enough uh, for all, I think. And a ketogenic diet um, is uh, high cost for uh, patients. Uh, but um, I think we are lucky olive oil is uh, good for ketogenic diet, but olive oil is also high cost nowadays. So we are in... Uh, uh, difficulties we have some difficulties for uh, like that thank you again I mean just and, add when in the end just one thing because the ketogenic diet what Ingrid mentioned Ingrid we've been working for the last 17 years trying to go towards less restrictive diets and uh, last year in Dublin we had actually even released on uh, we were taking multiple cuisines we we're making diets and more less restrictive so when one of our papers was in uh, published in JAMA Pediatrics where we had a head-on RCT between KD versus MAD versus LGIT and that was uh, uh, finding that KD and LGIT as uh, and uh, MAD were similar although we did not prove the non-inferiority and the only thing we found that KD and MAD you need four weeks to attain uh, seizure control but for LGIT you needed eight to twelve weeks when we saw on the ROC curve right now we just got a paper published this year uh, in which we have given intermittent LGIT that means on the weekends we are allowing the children to have a liberalized uh, you know glycemic index otherwise you needed a GI of less than 55 for one uh, Monday to Friday Saturday Sunday you are allowing a moderate GI between 55 and 75 so as to increase compliance and that has been proven as non-inferiority
uh, I'll send you both the papers. So I think we are just trying to go towards yeah. more uh, children and we are making most, all of them are indigenous so that except uh, except that uh, one recent study we just completed on, uh, because I uh, I saw this thing, like, Kosov had used ketokel in the first month with MAD so as to increase the ratio to 1.8 is to 1 to achieve a better seizure control, you know. So I actually copied that idea and I worked for West Syndrome. West Syndrome, you need a rapidity of, uh, you know, seizure control, right? So what I did was I have compared ACTH versus KD, rapid escalation. And I used the ketokel, the commercial preparation to help me aid achieve ketosis. I increased the ratio every day. And uh, I have got that, that I have got increased a similar response in both ACTH and KD uh, for West Syndrome without having given a, 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 a ACTH or steroids or vigabatrin before and uh, that's the first study of its kind and and also but uh, those who were given KD did not have relapse at all wow. uh, others with it, ACTH so this was something I mean this is trying to put permutation yeah. competition <laughs> You must publish that. Uh, yes, I, submit it. Submit it. I it's was, already submitted. <laughs> fantastic. Because, um, you know, I was so impressed with uh, the, like the modified Atkins diet modified to the Indian diet that was published yeah. from India that showed yeah, yeah. similar efficacy to our highly restrictive ketogenic diet. And yeah. I was so impressed because obviously one has to work within one's own population and in Absolutely. terms of what foods are available. Olive oil is very rich in Turkey, so it's a very nice solution. And <laughs> I know that also uh, with Indian cuisine, there can be cuisine with a lot of very significant oils, which uh, yeah. are, are compatible with the ketogenic diet and also palatable. Um, uh, when our ketogenic diet first started, it was a plate of butter balls, which was just horrific. Mm -hmm. Eating just yeah. butter, you know, just horrible. Uh, but now the diets are moving towards, I think, much more palatable diets and also more interesting diets for these children. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I just have to say that if one has a diet that um, a particular, uh, let's say, um, country can use efficaciously and that is available and is affordable, then that I think is the most important. And we each have to work within our own environments. Um, I, I have been so um, shocked at how little sugar can put someone out of ketosis. So uh, one example was a, a baby who had infantile spasms and, and then developed into status epilepticus and ended up in the ICU out of ketosis, had been on the ketogenic diet. And everyone searched for where the sugar could have come from. And the baby had eczema and was covered in this steroid cream. So there was enough absorption from the cream to put the child out of ketosis. The second example was a girl that, you know, again, was in status, um, had a... Uh, had um, one of these very bad epileptic encephalopathies, you know, gene-related epileptic encephalopathies, came out of the ICU, was on the ward, and suddenly the ketones disappeared. You know, like we, we generally get very high levels of ketones and the ketone level came down significantly. And I went to the mother and I said, did she have any sugar from any source? And the mother swore to me up and down, no, we're just doing the same diet we're always doing and the intravenous uh, fluids are normal saline, no, no sugar. And I told her the story about the baby. And then the next day she came to me and she said, oh, Dr. Tain, I'm so sorry. My daughter's lips were so chapped that I put cherry chapstick on her lips. And just the sugar from that you know, just dripping into the mouth, put the child out of ketosis. So that's when I realized how delicate that balance is and how little sugar is needed to put someone out of ketosis. So it's a very difficult diet, at least, you know, the, the classic, either MCT or LCT oil diet. And then you have to watch out for the renal stones. But the Absolutely. nutritional effects can be really significant. So I applaud you for what you do in your own different regions to try to find solutions that have a low glycemic index with the, the regular dietary foods that you have. And these all have to be published because I think we can benefit from knowing uh, you know, about other diets that can achieve a, a degree of ketosis but are not as restrictive. 
especially mm -hmm. if they're just as efficacious. And I think this work with West mm -hmm. syndrome definitely needs to be published. Yeah, it's already, it's in process. Uh, we just uploaded about a week back. So they have just, the other two I will send you. Thank you so much. We are really grateful to you. It was a wonderful, wonderful session, I think. And, you know, all these sessions are recorded and all of them are available. So this is the 52nd session we are having and uh, it's really very nice. Thank you so much. Mahesh, you want to say uh, anything? He's, uh, he was our first DM resident uh, from Ames, New Delhi. We started the DM Pediatric Neurology 20 years back. So we've completed two decades. Sangeeta is what, number five or six? What? Uh, uh, number, 10, number 10. Number 10? 10. 10. Okay. Yes. 10? He's number one. He's number one of my students and uh, Sangeeta's 10. So thank you so much. Really, really grateful to you. And thank you, Dr. Nihal and Kurat. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for Mahesh. these wonderful cases. Really beautifully worked up and beautifully managed. Thanks. Thank Mahesh, customary, thank you. Bye. Yes, you have to say. I thank Dr. Ingritain, uh, the experts and moderator for today's session, all the presenters for a wonderful case and a wonderful discussion. See you again after two weeks or from now. Thank you for that. <laughs>